Hello, and welcome to ERATE, What's New for 2022. I am Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And But one of my duties as, um, as Library Development Director is I'm also the State E-Rate Coordinator for Public Libraries in Nebraska. So it is my job to um, help all of our public libraries apply for and receive their E-Rate funding. I do consultations, training, workshops like this, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one sessions, any sort of um, answering questions that anybody has, doing that, uh, helping you step by step go through all the forms and all the steps in the process. Uh, so that is what um, my job is here. One of my jobs here at the Library Commission is to make sure you get through the E rate process. So in today's uh, workshop, we are going to go through the basics of the E rate program and then get into some specifics of doing some of the different forms, um, go through the whole process from beginning to end. Uh, today's workshop will be good for beginners, anyone who has never done E-Rate before. If this is your first time doing it and you have no idea what the program is all about, it's all about or if you're curious, we'll definitely do that. Um, but also good for people who have been doing E-Rate for years. Um, so it's good to have a refresher, an update on things that you might not have remembered or any little, any new things that might be have, have uh, come up in the program. So let's get started. So what is E-Rate? What are we talking about here today? Um, e -rate, the E-Rate program was created by the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And it is a federal program, as their mission statement here states, to ensure that schools and libraries can obtain high-speed internet access at affordable rates and keep students and library patrons connected to broadband by providing a discount on eligible services and equipment. So what does that all mean? Um, this is a discount program. It is not a grant. It is not a loan or anything like that. It, um, it is discounts on your monthly internet services, whatever, wherever, wherever you get your monthly internet from. And you can receive discounts on purchasing and installing any equipment in your library that may be needed to make that internet work. Uh, servers, switches, cabling, all of those kind of things. It is funded, the money for, to provide these discounts to schools and libraries comes from the universal service fee. This is a, a, a fee that we all pay um, as uh, users of internet or telephone service. And the telecommunications providers also, our internet service and phone providers also pay in. So you'll see this on your phone bill or your um, internet bill. It may say universal service fee, it may say USF, um, all um, these different acronyms and abbreviations for that. But we all pay into this pot of money that is then used to help our schools and libraries be able to afford um, good internet at their locations. So the E-Rate program is run by the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. They oversee the program, they set our rules and policies, so we look to them to, for the basics of how things should happen are supposed to happen. Uh, when they created the E-Rate program, they created the Universal Service Administrative Company, USE, which is called USAC, which is uh, a company that does the day-to-day -day administration of the E-Rate program. This is who you deal with regularly for all of your E-Rate applications. Um, USAC also handles some other programs as well. In addition to the E-Rate program, that's for schools and libraries, there is a, pro a uh, discount program for healthcare facilities, people uh, with low income and people in high cost areas. So when I'm talking about E-Rate to you and um, teaching and discussing it and working with you on it, you hear me reference USAC all the time because that's who you will be communicating with. And the schools and libraries program is a specific subset of USAC that is um, deals with E-Rate, which um, the E originally just it, it stands for, it's a kind of an abbreviation for education, so things for schools and libraries. E-Rate runs on a funding year. There's, um, there is a, when you're applying for E-Rate, you are thinking to the future. There, um, the funding year runs from July 1st through June 30th of, of uh, the following year. So right now, in e -rate, what you're applying for for E-Rate is for funding year 2022, which will start July 1st, 2022, and go through June 30th, 2023. Right now, we are in the 2021 funding year. Um, and libraries are already receiving the discounts for that. So, uh, and they're working on doing things related to the 2021 year that we're in right now. So in the 2021 funding year, you will apply for 2022. 
So you may be working on multiple funding years at the same time at a different step in the process of E-rate. So it's good to just try and keep in your mind that uh, keep straight which year you're work, trying to work with, depending on what you're doing, depending on what form you're submitting, um, what questions you've been asked from USAC. They'll always refer to the funding year um, right off the bat for, to let you know what exactly they're talking about. Is it the current one? Is it the future one? Is it from a few years ago? Whichever it is. So there's certain timing of program activities, certain things will happen at certain times throughout um, the funding year. Before a particular funding year starts, that's when you actually start your up application. Um, the form is available right now to start. That's what we're talking about right now. Today, um, you do competitive bidding, and we'll get into all the details of that later. Um, and you request, you know, decide who you're going to go with so that when the funding year starts on July 1st next year, you're all ready to go with your discounts. Um, at the beginning of the funding year, July 1st of whatever year it is, that's when your services that you will receive discounts on will, discounts on will start and your discounts will start happening. And then sometimes during and or after a funding year is what they call invoicing, which is when you receive your funding, your monies. Um, during the year, you can receive discounts automatically on your bills from your service provider. Via them, they'll automatically give you bills that already have that amount taken off. Uh, or after the funding year is over, you can have paid, if you paid your bills in full, then you can receive a discount directly, um, a reimbursement directly to you at your library. Um, you have a choice of which way you want to go with. Uh, some libraries, it, you can do it one way or the other, whichever you prefer. Some service providers work better one way or the other, but you've got those two options. So who is eligible for E-rate? Who can apply? Um, libraries and library systems must be eligible for, a, for per USAC FCC rules. They must be eligible to receive LSTA funds. This is Library Service and Technology Act funds. Um, the FCC has determined that state library agencies are in charge of deciding who this is, who does receive these funds, and who would then be considered an eligible library to apply for E-rate. Um, here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission, that's us, are, is the state library agency. So we have determined that in Nebraska, all public libraries are eligible because we use LSTA funding here at the Library Commission to provide all libraries with certain services. Um, they pay for some of the databases we might offer you, training, um, salaries, it all depends on uh, various things. And because you receive those services that are funded via LSTA, using LSTA funds, then you are receiving, must, you are eligible for LSTA funded things, and then you are eligible for, um, to apply for E-Rage. Um, schools and school districts are also eligible. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, I am the state, my duty is a state e-rate coordinator for public libraries specifically um, here in nebraska the department of nebraska department of education helps our schools and school districts apply and receive their e-rate funding so i don't deal with the schools um, and if we have consortia groups where we got together to get a discount on internet services you could also apply as a group if you wanted to um, but here in nebraska mostly we are uh, school districts applying the department of education helping out and individual libraries applying which i help out so the first thing I do when I'm talking to libraries about doing E-rate uh, for the first time is talking about deciding if it's something that's worth it for you to do. Um, and to do this, you can figure you, um, you you would want to figure out how much of a discount you are going to receive. Um, and you can do this yourself before even applying for any forms, before being part of the program, before um, submitting anything. Uh, you can just use um, some data that we have and calculate how much of a discount you would receive on your services if you did go through the E-rate process. Um, E-rate is in a year of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's funding years, there's forms to submit throughout the year. Um, it, you know, something that you have to keep up on regularly. So it can take some work to keep up on, uh, but if you can get a good discount, it could be worth it. So how much of a discount can your library receive? Um, anywhere from 20% to 90% off. Your services you can receive. This would be your monthly internet service and any equipment you might need to purchase to um, make that internet work. Uh, the discount is calculated by first looking at the percentage of students that are eligible for the school lunch program. This is the free and reduced lunches in the school district in which your library is located. So you may provide services to uh, students and children from other districts that nearby and that's fine you know they go wherever but for e-rate purposes they look at just specifically where is your library physically located 
what is that school district? We're going to look at those numbers. Um, the FCC decided they needed to use some way to figure out um, where the more needier areas in the country. And there are many different indicators of poverty you can look at. And they said we're going to use the school lunch program with the students, and that will determine who um, the more students that are eligible for the program, the higher the discount rate will be for that library. Um, Something to note here too, first, you can't include the pre-K numbers, um, although they receive services. Um, they just have you look at kindergarten through um, senior year, 12th grade. Um, and also it says it's the number of students that are eligible for the program, not necessarily, not that receive the school lunch program funding. So um, that not the ones that participate in the school lunch program. So there may be some people that are eligible, some families, but just don't need to. They, they figure out how they can cover their lunches themselves. They just don't want to apply for various reasons. So there's no worry about uh, private information going out. This is not, we're not asking for who are all the students getting this lunch. It's not that at all. It's just based on math and looking at the numbers, what percentage of the kids in the school district could would be eligible for the school lunch program. Um, in addition to that, you look at whether you're considered or considered urban or rural, where your library is located. And this is uses census data, U.S. Census data. Um, luckily, Nebraska are mostly rural, so we'll get, a, in some cases, a slightly higher discount rate. So where do you get these numbers from? Uh, luckily for us here, the Nebraska Department of Education posts their school lunch numbers on their website, and I've given you the link here. Um, all these links in this uh, presentation are also available on our E-Rate website that I'll show you at the end of the workshop. So you can go there and you can look up your school district and find out what percentage of the children are eligible. And then USAC posts, has, as on their website, a lookup tool to see whether you're considered urban or rural. Um, and as far as the FCC is concerned, urban areas are populations equal to or greater than 25,000. Anything below that is rural. So if you know the population in Nebraska, that's pretty much all the state is rural. A couple of pockets of, um, you know, our high density areas, but other than that, most of the libraries are rural. And then you look at the disc discount matrix that they have a chart to determine your discount with these two numbers. And here is the matrix. So down the side there, you can see the percentage of students that are eligible for the school lunch program, and then whether you're urban or rural. Uh, you'll notice here there's two categories, category one and category two. Um, there's two different types of funding you can receive, and I'll get into that in a second here. Um, but you can see here, with just 50% or less of your students eligible in a rural area, you can receive 70% off on your internet service. That could be huge for some library, for some of you. 70% uh, off on your monthly cost and 70% off on any equipment and things you may need to purchase. Uh, most of our libraries in Nebraska fall in the 60 to 80% uh, range, actually. So we have no, many of them that are 70 or 80%, so we're, um, um, discount rate. Now, we've got a few less and a few that hit 90, but most are in the middle there. So, uh, this is something to just you know look at to real you know if you're wondering or if you need to talk to your library board or your community about is this something I should be spending time on? Uh, like I said, it's an ongoing process. Certain times throughout the year, you got to do certain forms and keep up on things. But if you can receive 60, 70, 80 percent off on some of your bills, definitely worth the time and effort to go through doing it. So what can you receive an E-rate discount on? What is E-rateable? I don't know if E-rateable is a word, but I made it up for this uh, purpose. Um, every year, the FCC publishes their eligible services list. And is on, I've linked to it on our website. Um, this is a list of the type of the things that you can receive an E-rate discount on. Uh, now, there's a new list every year that is specific for that funding year. So if you are wanting to look at this list to determine what can I apply for next year, or um, did I apply for the right things this year, am I looking back on an older list for some reason, make sure you're looking at the right list for the right funding year. There are two categories of service, and they are separated basically um, by the library's wall. Uh, this is a graphic I put together here, this is uh, bricks, so that's what's through the library's wall. Uh, category one is services getting the high-speed internet connectivity, con connectivity to your library building. So um, your, whatever way you receive your internet, um, 
how it comes and gets the internet from your service provider just to your building walls. Um, and if you needed to do any um, one-time construction or installation of things outside the library building, that would fall on to, to make to get the internet, internet connection hooked up. Uh, that would be category one. Category two is after the internet service is at your building, how do you make it work in all, um, so that all the devices can use it? So all the equipment that runs your network, modems, routers, switches, wireless access points, cables, um, anything in the building physically that you would need to use to make it work, um, and the installation and upkeep of those um, pieces of equipment. Now, the devices, as you can see here, that would use the internet, those are not eligible for E-Rate. E-Rate is about, the in, about service, the internet service, and getting the service itself and making it work. The devices you use um, to access it are not anything that is eligible for E-Rate. So your laptops and PCs and phones, those themselves are not eligible for an E-Rate discount, but whatever it takes to get the internet to work on them, on all those devices, that is what's eligible for an E-Rate discount. So specifically for category one, this is basically anything that gets high-speed internet to your library. So any way of getting a cable modem, DSL, fiber, uh, wireless, satellite. Uh, this isn't every single thing, but this is just a, you know the most common ones. So any way you could um, you're receiving internet to your building from a service provider is eligible for, chat for category one. Now we have a lit and dark fiber. A little explanation about that. Um, fiber that is lit is just out there, it's available, service providers have it as a, as a service and you can sign up with them and just get it. Um, dark fiber is fiber that has, um, is out there, the actual fiber optic lines are out there but they have not been turned on yet. Uh, when fiber is being laid and has been laid over the years, they put in more fiber optic lines than is needed at the time, thinking of there will be an increase in de demand in the future. And so it's out there just waiting for someone to use it. Uh, with E-Rate, you can um, put out feelers and see who owns this dark fiber. And if it is something that can be run to your library and your community, then you can have them turn it on and then you're able to use the dark fiber um, once it becomes lit. Um, there's a note here that if you are looking to see if someone has dark fiber, you got to apply for both lit and dark at the same time. Uh, luckily, our first form in the E-Rate process, when you're requesting, looking for services, the 470 uh, automatically requires you to do that. But they want you to, you know, get all, see all your options, um, gather all the information you can about what might be available, what you could potentially receive uh, as a service um, to see, you know, so they, they make it kind of do that automatically. Also part of category one is special construction. If you need to, and this is specifically for just running new fiber, so only if you're looking at a fiber connection, uh, if you need to run, um, for example, there may be a fiber line that comes to somewhere in your community, but it's a few blocks away from the library building, or fiber is, you know, in the next town, but you need to bring it to your community. Uh, special construction is a one-time cost for getting that installed, having those lines run to your building, and you can receive um, a discount on that, your, your discount on all those construction costs um, under category one. So this would include the design, project management, um, the actual work being done, um, all of that can be, uh, you can get a discount on. Now, USAC does know, does understand that uh, Companies doing this kind of construction don't necessarily, can't necessarily work just within the E-rate funding year of that July 1st to June 30th. So they do allow you to start construction up to six months before the funding year starts. So up to January of a funding year, you can actually have this construction done. Um, and even though it's before the funding year has started, you will still receive your E-rate discount on it. Um, the idea is when the funding year starts, the construction's all done and you start off on July 1st, you have your fiber connection ready to go and you are able to start using it. Now, um, a new thing that E-Rate set up, that USAC set up a few years ago related to special construction is uh, encouraging state matching funds, uh, encouraging li uh, states to come up with funding to help libraries pay for the extra amount that some, a, a special construction project may cost. So if a library has a disk, you know, the project costs a certain amount, and they, they receive some of that discounted, they still have to cover whatever's left. Um, if a state can come up with state matching funds, the E-rate will then provide will up to additional 10% matching whatever the state is, is helping the library pay for for that difference. Um, so this is for new construction, 
to just bring uh, the fiber and fiber for the first time to a school or a library. So this can't be used just for upgrading your fiber or making your speed faster. This is if you don't have fiber at all and you want it for the first time. Um, so the math here, and this is just kind of a nice round number math <laughs> uh, to make it easy to understand. Uh, you have a, a bid from a, a service provider who says we can run fiber from where it is to your building, <clears throat> excuse me, and it'll cost $100,000. The library has an 80% E-rate discount. So E-rate, already right off the bat, just the basic E-rate program pays $80,000 of that, and the library is still responsible for, responsible for the extra $20,000. But in the state, there's a state matching fund that says we'll do 10% of our project, so that's 10%, $10,000. And then E-rate says, oh, you have a state matching fund, we'll match that state, those state funds, and we'll also contribute $10,000 making the library and the community's cost to have fiber run zero. So here's just the numbers here, $100,000 project, E-rate discount pays 80% of it, the state pays, pay, E-rate discount has, pays 80,000, state pays 10,000, E-rate pays another 10,000 matching that state uh, funding and the library has to pay nothing. So this is an awesome deal. Why am I mentioning this? because we have this in Nebraska now. As of last year, we have a special construction state matching program uh, through the Nebraska Public Service Commission. Um, in Nebraska, we have our own universal service fee. Um, that's what the NUSF 117 up there at the top, and this is the Project 117, um, the Nebraska Universal Service Fund, uh, and is run through the Public Service Commission. And they have budgeted a million dollars to use over four years to help libraries and schools get fiber run to their buildings. Um, this started with last year and it's available through 2024. We I have a link there that goes to the Public Service Commission webpage with all the information about applying and how it all works. Last year we had six libraries do this and receive the discount and, um, and receive the state matching funds and get fiber into the library. And we're hoping to have a lot more over the next three years of this available funding. Uh, in order to receive this, you do have to apply for E-rate just like you normally would uh, using your 470 form to see who's got fiber out there and who can run it. Uh, you pick who you're going to go with and decide who you um, are going to provide the service. Um, and then you tell, you apply to the Public Service Commission saying, hey, we've made this decision. Uh, we'd like to apply to you for this funding. Now, for the current year, the deadline is passed to get into this for 2021, unfortunately. The deadline to, submit, to apply to the Public Service Commission to receive their state matching funds is December 31st, 2021. Uh, in E-rate, you have to wait uh, during a competitive bidding period when you first do your 470 um, until you can make your decision. You have to wait 28 days. Because of the timing of this, the timing of this workshop, that 28 days is going to be past December 31st before you could make your decision. Um, but that's okay. The reason I'm mentioning it, though, is so you under know what the pro program is, know what the process is, and can look into it for next year or the year after. Um, so this will, because, as I said, this will be, still be available for another couple of years. Um, so you will have to do your 470 early enough in the year, um, in the fall usually. Uh, pick who you're going to go with. Then you submit the application of the universe to the Public Service Commission with a copy of your 470 and who you've decided to choose as your provider. Sometime in January, they will let you know if you've been approved. And then you would do your second form of the process, the 471, which is where you tell USAC, here's who we've picked to go with and here's the services we're going to receive. And then you will include a letter from the Public Service Commission with that form saying, and we've got state matching funds so that that E-rate knows to, to, that they will match those that, that dis, those state matching funds later if you all get approved. Um, I will tell you that for this for 2021, um, all the libraries that applied to do this did receive the funding. Um, they um, they applied to the 470. They applied to the Public Service Commission. All of them received the matching funds and are now um, getting the fiber <coughs> have the fiber installed um, at the at the discount. So something to know about and to look forward to for next year. We do do, um, earlier this year, we did specific workshops just on the state um, special construction and state matching funds. We do that earlier in the year in, in the summer. So look forward to that next year if you are uh, potentially thinking about doing this or if something that would be helpful to you. <clears throat> so that's all of our category one. 
what is available, your basic internet service, and any kind of special construction. Now, category two is what they call internal connections. All the equipment that needs to be in your building to make the broadband work throughout your library. Uh, so this would be all those things in your network closet, like this wonderful picture, these nice neat, neat cables on here. So your uh, routers and switches and cables and access, wireless access points, uh, power supplies, um, any software needed to run the network. So specifically network software, not something like Microsoft Word that you'd use on a computer, but compute anything that would need to run your network. Um, updating all of that is eligible for, is what category two is. Uh, racks are the actual shelves that these, uh, so the physical racks that these pieces of equipment may sit on in your closet, in your, in your network closet or wherever you have it set, um, set up in your library. So all of these things are what, is eligible all these pieces of equipment but also the basic maintenance of these pieces of equipment you of this is these internal connections uh, once you have something installed you're going to need to update it at some point uh, you might need to repair things uh, a squirrel might get in the walls you chew through the cables uh, your internet cables and you need to have them rerun um, all of those kind of things are also eligible for e-rate discount too um, specifically, this basic maintenance is only the work that they will actually do for you. So you may have a company who you have on call, and for example, $20 a month, you pay them to be on call whenever you might need something done. And that's great, but you can't get any rate discount on something unless they have to actually come and do work. If they come and they have to you know, charge you their hourly rates or whatever the equipment they needed to um, replace, the charge for those, those costs of actually doing work is what you can receive um, any rate discount on. Um, in the e-rate forms, when we get into when I get into showing you how that works, they have it set up now where if you select you want to receive an e-rate discount on any piece of equipment here, it gives you a little checkbox to say, and we also want to receive e-rate discount if we ever need to do basic maintenance on the, this particular piece of equipment. So they have a nice slick do it both together in one kind of a bundle. Um, in, a, in addition, there could be some things that fall into either category one or two. Um, all your taxes and surcharges and fees that going along with purchasing your equipment or paying your monthly internet fee um, is eligible. So make sure that you include those costs in when you're applying to e-rate and saying it's going to cost me this month, this much. It's not just the cost of the service, but all those fees too. Um, for getting equipment, training charge, or shipping charges, installation charges, all of that set up, any of those costs are eligible. Uh, training specifically to train your staff to know how to run the network if you have to pay to send them to go to training somewhere or to watch a webinar or something, uh, that is eligible as well. Now it may be Confusing to some of our libraries out there, I may not know what exactly is all these pieces of equipment. What are they? How do I know what I have? How do I know uh, what I should even or could even upgrade to? And we have available to us this um, Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. This is something that is out there free for anyone to use. It's specifically designed for our small and rural libraries. Um, it was funded by a grant from IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and we actually had staff here, uh, Holly Wolt, who was involved in, in this, uh, who created this, and they just had a recent, they had an updated grant, a new grant just this past year where they updated the information in it as well. So it's very current, very useful. Um, it is basically takes you question, uh, question and answer thing of going into your network closet, looking at all of your equipment that you have, and figuring out what it all is. Taking an inventory, um, determining the, the brands, the models, how they all work, and then um, giving you suggestions of a plan of how you could upgrade, which pieces might need to be upgraded now, which ones are still good because they're relatively recent, um, different things you can do to do that. Um, so we do, you know, we have libraries in Nebraska, you probably don't have IT person. You don't have an, a specific person on, very often they don't have a specific person on staff who, who is in charge of keeping care of your IT. It might be you as the one library staff person or uh, um, as like a, side thing you do. Maybe someone in the community who comes in just to help you out because they know a lot about this kind of thing. And that's great. But this will help you if you don't know, if you don't have anybody who you can who does this for you and you need to figure it out yourself. Or even you do have someone who does this for you, they um, this could help them just to you know 
organize everything that you have in the library and what it's all about. So we have a link to this on our E-Rate website as well. So we highly recommend going there and using this uh, Tor Gigabit Libraries Toolkit to try and figure out what you have, <coughs> excuse me, and what you could or should, <coughs> excuse me, be updating. So Category 1 and Category 2 work a little differently when it comes to receiving your funding. Category 1 is pretty cut and dry. You pay a monthly amount for something, you receive a percentage off of that. For Category 2, USAC and he has set it up a little differently and created what they call budgets, um, a chunk of money that you can use gradually um, to purchase any of the equipment or update any equipment that you have. <clears throat> now, I think they use the word budget, and I find that a little confusing and misleading because to me, budget means here's money, go ahead and spend it. This is more of a mathematical thing where we're you know, setting aside for you some, you know, there's a little do a calculation and we we're kind of holding on to this amount of money for you and as you want to you can kind of use it, you will use it down throughout it and so let's explain that a little better here um, USAC has um, calculates five-year budgets you have a certain amount of money you can use over a five-year time period and you can use it to purchase anything under that category two um, section they have specific five-year blocks of time and right now we're in the 2021 through 2025 five-year time period. The next one will be 2026 through 2030. So from now through 2025, there's a budget that they calculate that you can use to purchase these equipment. Um, they did a pilot project of this over the last five or six years to figure out if this how this would work and if it was good. And they seemed to like it and it worked and libraries were getting their um, money. So now it is a official way of calculating this. Um, at the beginning of that five-year time period, they, dis they decide how much you're going to receive. Uh, they do not adjust it throughout that five-year cycle for inflation or anything. It's just in the beginning. So in 2021, the amount you received was determined, and then you have to wait to 2026 for them to determine the next five-year um, cost. However, you can request a budget recalculation any time in the budget cycle. So USAC won't, won't, won't proactively make any changes to the amount that are, is available. But if you know you have some sort of change, like your school lunch numbers have changed so much that your, your discount number has changed, and you can request that they, make, they look at it again and recalculate your particular library's budget. Um, and I'm going to show you in just a second here what those numbers are. Um, the library, you can receive discounts on the cost of services up to your budget amount, but this doesn't mean you can only spend that much, uh, that amount. For example, if you have a $100,000 project, but your Category 2 budget is only $50,000, that's okay. Um, you're allowed to do things that are bigger than the budget, just understand that E-Rate will only give you a discount on the first $50,000 of that $100,000, because that's all you have available. Um, now, how is this actually calculated? What amount of money are we talking about here? For the current five-year period we're in, um, for libraries, it is calculated by looking at the total square feet of the library, of your library building, how big your space is that you have. So you may have this on um, blueprints. Uh, I know we also, it is submitted as, it is reported as on your public library survey. So you can look there, whatever number you put there is your square feet of your building. Um, anything in the walls, all in the floors, all of that, that's the library. And you take that number and multiply it by $4.50, so it's $4.50 per square foot. But there's a minimum budget of $25,000. Everybody, by default, gets to $25,000 budget to use over the next five years. Um, so budgets can also be recalculated whenever you want if the size of your building changes. So that request for a recalculation that you can do could be for not just because your school lunch numbers have changed, but if you had an expansion onto the building, if you built a new building that's a completely different size, um, you can um, tell USAC that, and then they will recalculate your budget midstream in the middle of a five-year period. So keep, keep track of that and make sure if anything changes that you let them know so they can um, change that for you. So here's math to show you exactly what we're talking about here. Um, if your library is 3,500 square feet, 3,500 times 450, is $15,750, but we do have a $25,000 $25, minimum. So um, you get, actually get $25,000. So if your library is bigger, then you would get whatever that math came up to be. 
Now, this is where it gets a little confusing. You don't have 25,000 to, to actually use. What they then do is they take whatever your E-rate discount percentage is and apply that to this, and that's the amount you get. So they say you have 25,000, but in this case, you have a 50% discount rate. E-rate will just cover 50% of that. So very similar to category one, where it's your thing costs this much, E-rate will only cover 50% of that. Your budget is this much, E-rate will give you 50% of that to use. So in this case, there's $12,500 is ends up being what you can spend on category two services during the current five year period, which we're in right now, 2021 through 2025. Um, so this is the basic starting of your calculation. Uh, the E-rate e is done in, you have an online account that I'm gonna show you how to look at and use in a bit here. And they keep track of this for you, which is great. In your account, there's a place where you can look at your category two budget, and as you use it to apply for and purchase things, they will do the math and, and deduct from that automatically and show you what you have left to use throughout the five year period. So you don't have to keep track of this yourself somewhere in a piece of paper in a spreadsheet. It's kept track of on the USAC side as you apply. All right, do we have any questions? Let's pause for questions here right now. Any questions about what you can receive a discount on, uh, who's eligible, how all this funding works? You can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I see that here, and I can answer any questions you have right now about what we've talked about so far. So I'll give you um, a minute to do that. All right, no problem. If you have whenever you think of a question, just go ahead and type it in. You don't have to wait for me to ask. So. so one other thing you do need to think about when it comes to doing E-rate is SIPA and filtering. SIPA being the Children's Internet Protection Act and filtering talking about having some sort of a software program or something that blocks um, access to certain websites and certain um, sites on your computers. Um, because E-rate is federal funding, you are required to be in compliance with SIPA uh, for your internet connection and any of that equipment that is used to make the internet work. Um, SIPA only requires three things. There's the um, filter itself, the technology protection measure. Um, this can be software you install on individual workstations. It can be something you do on your network. It can be something your service provider provides from their end. And before the internet even gets to your building, it's already got filtering working on it. Um, in addition, you have to have an internet safety policy, something that talks about um, keeping, and SIPA is specifically for children, so it's about keeping minors safe and from any harmful information on the, that they might come across on the internet. Uh, you may have this already as part of your other policies at the library um, as part of your, your use policy or something, internet use policy or computer use policy, and that's fine. It doesn't have to be its own special internet safety policy. As long as you address the different things that SIPA wants you to somewhere in your library policies, you've got that covered. And then at some point, you would have to have a public notification or meeting um, about the fact that you're doing this. Uh, generally, this would be an agenda item on a board meeting letting your community know we're talking about it, we're deciding we've picked this thing, or we're investigating doing this, something like that has to be on there. That's something you just do once. Um, so that's all the three things that you need. Um, USAC has information on their website about how SIPA works with it, with E-Rate. Uh, now, SIPA can be a controversial topic for some people. Uh, some staff, some library staff, uh, or boards are completely against filtering of any kind because they think it is uh, censorship and they're about intellectual freedom and freedom of information. Everyone should be able to access whatever they want without chance of something being blocked. Um, all the way to the other extreme where you must protect the children at all costs and everything horrible must be blocked from anyone seeing it on the internet and anything in between. Um, for E-rate purposes, I don't get into the philosophy of it. I just get into what you need to do to be in compliance and meet E-rate requirements. Um, SIPA can be, can seem like it's intimidating or overwhelming, but it's really not, there's not much to it. Uh, the whole act is about 14 pages long. Um, there's, it is very, very simply written, um, not a lot of detail. For example, it does not tell you these are the websites you must block. There's no list of saying you have to block YouTube, you have to block Facebook. The, 
the federal government has not said any of that. Um, it says you must block things that might be harmful to minors. And they leave that up to you at the library in your community to decide what you think is harmful, uh, at what level you might, how strongly you might filter something. Um, most filters have different levels, strong, medium, lower. Um, specific websites you can um, allow or not allow, so you can do it case by case. And that's all up to you at the community level on how to do that. Um, it also states that for adults, uh, oh, it also states that first, um, that any computer that accesses the internet needs to have filtering on it. So if you are having, using E-rate money to get a discount on your internet service, any computer that connects must be filtered. Not just the children's computers, if you have those in a separate area, even though this is about children, it didn't get that specific. So it's not, it could have been better written. <laughs> uh, so even your adult computers and your staff computers must be filtered as well. However, there is also a criteria in the act that states for adults who are doing bona fide research or work, you must be able to turn off the filter. So you install the filter everywhere, either individually on a computers or um, on, on routers or wherever. And then for your staff computers, turn it off. For your adult computers, if you want to, turn it off. And you're still compliance, in compliance with SIPA. You just have, have had installed it at some point, show you and have your documentation showing that you've installed it. And um, but then you turn it off on the ones that you don't actually want to be filtered or have anything blocked, and you're good to go. Um, so a few things just to think about if you're um, iffy about SIPA, not sure about how you know I don't want to be blocking things and, and doing this. It, you know, remember there's things in there that will let you undo it, uh, that require that you are allowed able to turn it off so you don't block things. We don't generally recommend specific filtering programs here from the Library Commission. There's just too many variables at your library uh, to, to tell you here's the one you should use. Um, I have information on our E-Rate website about SOPA and suggestions and recommendations for filters that you can look at and use. Um, but you could also talk to our um, IT person here, um, Holly Wolt, or our technology innovation librarian, Amanda Sweet, here at the Library Commission. Either of them can consult with you on what might be a good filter in your situation. So that's just one other thing that you need to be aware of for e -rate. Now we're going to talk about the E-Rate forms themselves, getting into the nitty-gritty nitty of how this all works. As I said, there are multiple forms throughout the year that you must submit. Uh, the first three forms here, everyone has to do, all libraries have to do. The last one, uh, the balloons in blue there, it depends on how you're going to receive your discount. And we're getting into the much more detail about all of these as we go on today. Um, the first form, which is available right now, is your 470, where you're just reaching out and saying, hey, I'm looking for somebody to provide me with this service, and I'd like to get the E-rate on it, E-rate discount on it. The 471 is the second form where you tell you, Zach, hey, I've picked who I want to go with and the service that we're going to get. Um, after that form, USAC evaluates, reviews your application, and lets you know if you're going to be approved or not. And if you are, then you do your 46, where you say, thank you, I would like my money, and my, my service has started. And then the last step is your invoicing, where you say, I've paid my bills, or I am paying, give me my reimbursement. Um, you can receive discounts on your bills if you do that. You, your service provider submits the 474 to USAC and asks them to reimburse the provider for what they've discounted you. If that's what you're doing, you are done with the EA process after your 46. You just have to do those first three forms. The service provider is responsible for, some, for asking for their money back from USAC. You aren't. But if you aren't doing that and you're paying your bills in full and you want a reimbursement afterwards, then you at the library do the 472, which they call the bear form. Um, the build entity application reimbursement form. Um, and then you do that form to receive the funding sent to you directly. Um, they do, this is done by a direct deposit to your library's account or whatever bank account you indicate. So you do have to submit one other form just once, the 498, to give them your banking information. This is just like when you do a direct deposit for uh, your job and you're you know, getting your salary put directly into your bank account. You do that for this as well. So you do that 498 one time. So it's ready to go. The other forms you do every year for every funding year. 
Um, and then, of course, the last one, depending on how you're receiving your discount, you would do it or the service provider would do it. And we're going to get into more detail about all this. This is just a very quick overview of how the basic process works. And now we're going to dig into each individual form um, a little later. Uh, USAC does have a document retention policy. You must keep copies of any e-rate paperwork for 10 years. There we go. Uh, 10 years after the last date of service. So that would be the end of a funding year. So for the uh, e-rate funding year we're applying for right now, which is 2022, you would need to keep everything related to this year through June 30th, 2033, 10 years after the last date of service. Uh, this would also count for any sort of contract you might have signed previously to 2022. So you might have some sort of a contract where it's just a, a monthly one. It always just keeps rotating, going on and on. Um, you don't sign a new contract every couple of years or anything. And you may have originally signed up with this company back in 2010. That contract still applies to your 2022 internet. So you need to keep that through 2033 as well. So um, just you know, keep depending on how you're having that set, how your internet set up, you may have to keep things that are a lot older too. Um, for SIPA, you just keep everything forever because it's going to apply to every single year you ever do E-rate. If you can make sure that you can show them that you are in compliance. Um, the reason this is done, the reason you need to keep things is because USAC can do what they call audits. Now, this is not like an IRS audit where you've done something wrong and they're coming to, you know, figure out what you did wrong and get you in trouble. Uh, this is more of a, they do a checks and balances type thing where they will randomly pick libraries and they want to evaluate and see, did you uh, understand the process? Did it work for you? How did you do with applying this, submitting this form and that form? And they can go back via FCC rules. They can go back 10 years if they want to, to look at what you had done. So you need to be able to get to them anything they may ask for, any sort of documentation. Now, you don't need to have piles of paper all over the place or big binders or anything. Um, that you can have it either in electronic or paper format. So if you don't want to have to have stacks and stacks of papers for 10 years worth or file cabinets full of them, just scan everything, save it to a flash drive or somewhere folder on your computer, wherever, label it, you know, E-rate, funny year 2022, Everything is in there, so if they ever look for it, they can come. You know, you have a place where you can easily go to get it. You just need to be able to get them whatever they want to um, have you, whatever they want to look at. So the kind of things you must keep is any forms or letters that you um, have received, any forms you've submitted, letters you received from USAC. Um, these letters are now sent all electronically to electronically to you, so you'll have them in an email. They're also in your E-rate account online. Um, any bids you've received, any contact with, with um, service providers, invoices, receipts for anything, equipment you purchased for installation, um, copies of that um, of any decision making you had to do where you decided who you're going to go with. Um, anything that has to do with it, just make copies, um, scan it, do whatever you need to, and just hold on so that you hold on to it for those 10 years so you make sure um, you can get to it whenever you set the might ask. So I have been talking about the online E-Rate account that you use, and this is EPIC, the E-Rate portal. Um, EPIC is the E-Rate Productivity Center, um, acronym, the letters EPC, but it is pronounced EPIC. Uh, technically, it could work in any um, browser. It's just an online um, interface. But they only guarantee that it will work in Chrome or Firefox. Let's see, I'm just double checking something here. Okay. All right, so technically it can work in anything, but um, USAC only guarantees that it will work in Chrome or Firefox. If you use other browsers, there's a chance things can not work correctly. Um, you may think you submitted a form. We've actually had this happen, and it, but it really hasn't gone through. USAC's not received it. Things have happened. So you must, um, with, with Internet Explorer, Safari, any other kinds of browsers. So use Chrome or Firefox to do your E-rate work. Um, Epic is a uh, one-stop shopping for all of your E-rate 
program services that you need to do. Um, uh, you can submit your forms there. USAC will reach out to you asking questions, um, receive reminders, notifications, updates about things. You can ask USAC questions if you have questions about anything. Um, so everything you need, all your forms is all there um, online in one place. Um, and this is the URL for it uh, to get to the page uh, usac.org slash e hyphen rate. Now to log in um, to use the system, USAC creates an account for your organization, which for you would be your library. And then an individual person, one person has to be identified and, as the account administrator, the person who has all the ability to do everything in the account. Uh, generally that would be maybe the library director, or if you're lucky and have a staff person that you've identified and indicated you're in charge of doing all the E-rate stuff. Um, account administrators can create additional users if you have more people, multiple people that you need to have access to your E-rate account and decide what level of permissions they can have. Uh, a full user can do anything, complete forms, file forms, certify forms, which is signing off a look officially and submitting them. A partial user can just complete forms but not submit or certify. Um, this is mainly for larger organizations where you have multiple staff and like um, you, you told your tech person, since you know all this internet stuff, you submit, you complete the form, but I'm the director and I'm the only one authorized to sign off and applying for this funding. So they would, someone else would submit. Um, they can also update or information about your organization, about your library, if you need to make changes, library name or address or anything. And then there's a view only option where they can see all the forms and things but can't enter anything in, can't do anything, can't submit forms, but they can also make those organizational changes only. So this is the USAC main screen uh, where you go to USAC, their main webpage, usac.org slash erate. And there's two sign in buttons there, uh, one at the top that's always there in the top menu. And then at the lower left, there's another one on the main screen. They both do the same thing. They both go to log you into your E-rate account. So you can use either one to get into your, to log in. When you first log in, uh, when you hit that button, you get this uh, pop-up that comes up first that tells you if this is your first time using this, what they call their one portal system to log in, you must do this, this these steps here of, uh, about uh, resetting your password, creating a new password. Now, this is something that is very confusing, become confusing to some people. And I wanna be very clear here. You only do this, as I've highlighted here in red, the first time you sign in here. So if it's your very first time using Epic, you have to um, do go through this forgot password process. After you do that once, the first time, you don't have to do it every single time again. You don't have to um, do it again. You don't have to change your password every time you go and log into the system. You, so the, after you do this once, you then ignore those eight steps and you just, when you hit sign in, you just ignore all of that and just hit continue and actually enter your username and password that you've created. So it is a little confusing. Um, you do have to change your password every 90 days for security purposes, but when you try to log in, it will let you know when it's time to do that. So you still just ignore all this. Don't try, you don't have to keep track of those 90 days or whatever yourself. Every, when you go and type in your username and password, once something's expired, and notice pop up saying, hey, it's expired, pick a new one. So for the first time though, you're gonna hit continue. And you see this is where you could enter your username and password, but you're gonna click this forgot password link. Um, this is something you've probably used over the years many times. <laughs> uh, I know I, you know, you forget, you've got so many systems and so many data places you log into that you uh, don't remember what you, 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 you create, what your password was that you may have created. Um, so you click on that forgot password link and then it will say um, enter your username and we can send you an email you can reset the email. Your username is your email address. Whatever email address you have um, given to USAC to, to be your main email. So you um, enter your email address there, hit reset via email. They then send you a USAC password request email, typical, same as every other kind of um, email resetting. And then a link in there that you can click on to reset your password. And you'll note this expires in one hour, so you have an hour to go ahead and do your reset your password. 
once you do that, then you go back to the screen to sign in. Don't worry about, don't do that forgot password thing again. Hit continue and then enter the username and password you created. And then you can log in. Yeah. So now every other time after you've done that forgot password only once, you just go here and log in. You ignore those eight steps and just hit continue. Uh, you also check, click the box here to accept their terms and conditions, and then hit sign in. Click sign in. USAC has also last year started doing multi-factor authentication. Uh, this is something you may have used in many other uh, programs as well, where they send a code number typically to your telephone, uh, your cell phone maybe, and then you use that number to uh, verify extra secure an extra step of security verify that it's you um, I do not recommend using your personal cell phone for this because this is work related you don't want you know don't want to cross those kind of things together um, but they will do it to your email the email that you're using for your epic account here so you it's going to make you send an email authentication uh, uh, do the email authentication it automatically pre-fills in your email address you hit send email and then it will say a passcode has been sent to the following email address and then this is where you'll enter it so you leave this up on your screen, go to wherever you get your email, and you will have an email sent directly to you that says one-time verification code in the subject heading. Then there's a six-digit number that you'll use. And this is only good for 10 minutes, you note here. And then it expires. So I recommend, and this is what I do myself, whenever you get one of these, after you've used that code, go back to your email as soon as you can and delete this particular message. That way you don't potentially use an old code in a, at a future time you're trying to log in. Because once you've used this and that 10 minutes has passed, you can't use it again. It's going to be a new code every time you go to log in to the system. So we're going to take that six digit code, enter it, hit verify, and now we've gotten logged in. There are two different options here in the center of the page here of what you can access. There's at the bottom is the second one is the Emergency Connectivity Fund. This is a special program the FCC set up for help giving libraries and schools money to actually buy the devices. Uh, a separate program from E-Rate. E-Rate is only about the service. Um, it is related to the COVID-19 pandemic in response to that. So that program is done. They, the money has been applied for, but libraries are working on getting their funding. So um, that's still there. Uh, what you want is the E-Rate Productivity Center for the E-Rate program. So if you click on that box, you are logged into your applicant landing page. And now this is a long page here, and you probably can't read all this, but we're going to dig into some of the different parts of it so you'll get a little closer look. Uh, specifically, in the, about the middle here, it says My Entities, and I want to show you, I zoom into that, um, this entity number. This is also sometimes called your build entity number or your BEN. You'll see that somewhere, B-E-N. Uh, this is a number that's assigned to your library by USAC when you're first set up as an, as a, as an organization to do E-Rate. Uh, similar to like a social security number for a person, it's a number that always is uh, associated with your library. So whenever USAC reaches out to you or contacts you or asks you for information, they will always say, what's your BEN? What's your build entity number? Um, even if your library's name changes, if you, you know, have money donated and you have to change it to something like leave something library, uh, that will always be the same entity number for your library. Also, at the very bottom of the page, there is this FCC forms and post-commitment requests section. This is where you can look up any of your library, any of your E-rate forms that you've submitted. Uh, I oftentimes, very, very often, get questions from libraries saying, can you tell me if I did this form? Uh, did it get submitted? Did I miss something? And where am I am in the process? Uh, you can look this up yourself right here in your account. You can choose whatever form you want to look up, 470, 471, 486, and then what funding year it may um, you want to look at. Um, I did this example here for 2021, and I have two different ones here. And you'll notice over here on the right, the status, one is incomplete and one is certified. Certified means it, means it has been submitted. USEC has it. You, you're done. You've submitted the form. Incomplete means you started working on it, but you haven't finished it, and it is still there waiting for you to, to, to work on, um, or you didn't get something done, so it hasn't actually been submitted. Uh, 
I mentioned also that USAP will send you notifications and reminders about things. This goes into a section called your news section in your account. Now you'll notice up here in this blue bar, there's a news link. This is news for every single applicant in the E-Rate program. If you click on that, you will get everybody's information. It's not very easy to navigate or use to find yours. The way to get just your library's news items and notifications is from here on your landing page, underneath the USAC logo here, it says welcome and your library name. So you click on your library name, and then this is your, your institution's info. There's a whole bunch of menu things, items across the top here. Um, I'll mention here also that category two budget calculation I was mentioning earlier. This is where you can always look up and see where you're at. But for your news, there's a news section, news item. Click on that, and then you just receive your notifications. You're just looking at your libraries up dates and notifications and letters and anything they sent to you. So don't ever click on this news up here in the blue bar. It's too much. It's just everything. Use the menu. I Use your welcome link and do the news that's just for your library. You will also notice there's a tasks item up here, which you definitely should click on regularly to see what you have in your task. Um, this is where if you set, if you started a form and you need to continue working on it, keeps it here. Um, this first item here, it says uh, the form's been submitted and it's ready for certification. So it's waiting for me to go in and certify and complete submitting it. Uh, when you, this is also something that can cause some annoyance if you don't keep up with things here. Whenever you start a form and when you go in and see that we're actually doing one, you'll see what it looks like. Uh, you create a form. As soon as you hit the button saying, I want to do a form, before you've even entered any info into it, it starts up a process, a task for you to work on that form. Um, and it, it, to help you, to remind you that you need to do this, USAC will send you um, email notifications, email reminders saying, hey, you need to work on this form. And the wording of it, I think, is misleading and confusing. It says, create SEC Form 471. And it says that in the email you'll receive, too. Now, this may make you think, oh, it's telling me it's time for me to create one. No, what it means is you have created one and you need to continue. And you know, don't forget, you need to, you might want to continue working on it. So the wording could use some work. Uh, but uh, this system that they have here built by this company, APM, it was not built from scratch for E-rate purposes. <laughs> it's for other things. And some things they have to kind of work with what they got. So if you receive emails saying you need to work on a form, but you know you've done it, you double check and make sure, yeah, I've already submitted that. These are probably some that you started and didn't finish, uh, might have gotten distracted and pulled away, or you clicked on it and realized, oh, wait, I don't know what I'm doing. Close out, of, just let me close my browser and I'll come back to it. But they're just kind of floating out there. So regularly go here and see what you have, and you can delete these. You can discard these. Um, and I'll show you when we get into these forms where the button is to do, to do that. Um, this is the email that I mentioned that they'll send to you, um, reminding you, hey, you have this form out there. And it will say new task, create FCC form, whatever. Very confusing, makes you think you're due to do something. No, it just means you started a form. And here's a little nudge to remind you don't forget to finish it. So keep an eye on those tasks. If you see anything in here that you know doesn't need to be here, click on it, discard it, and keep things cleaned up for yourself. So another part of your account to know about is your user information. This is you as an individual person using working on the library's account. On the upper right here is a little head silhouette. If you click on that, this pops up, this box, and you can click on profile for your profile information. This is also where you have your sign out button. So when you're done, you can log out of the system. Uh, when you click on that, it brings you to your profile and there's these buttons right here in the center that say edit. But there's this big red notice that says, please don't use red buttons. Use the Manage Epic User Profile button in the upper right. So uh, another one of those things didn't work exactly how they wanted them to, so they had to give you a note. So if you just click on these here, they don't actually let you do anything. Use the button in the upper right to manage your user profile. Uh, and this is where you can change all the information about yourself, if your name, phone number, address, anything related to you. You'll know you cannot change your username, your email address. Once you give them an email address to use, that is locked in. Uh, however, you may need at some point to change that, and I'll show you in a second here how you can do that. 
You can also add other users, work on other, um, if you have other people who have a, you've created accounts for in here, this is the person you as the account administrator. Um, up here in the upper right on your landing page is all the different menu items for different things you can do. And manage users is one of those options. You will select your library by checking in the box. Uh, this may seem weird to have to choose yourself from a list of just yourself, your own library, but this is for, uh, there, you know, there are school districts with multiple locations, multiple schools, libraries with multiple branches. They would have all of those listed here and have to pick the correct one. Uh, you'd have to pick the one that you are actually at. Uh, but for us, we're just a single library, so we just pick ours. Um, we could add and remove existing ones, or we can create a new one. So I'm going to show you how to do that here from scratch. Um, you just get a blank information, um, put in the person's name, title. This is where you then enter an email address to create an account for the first time for someone. When you do this, this person will be sent an email saying, hey, an account's been created for you. They will then have to click on that email and go through that first time process of forgot password and setting themselves up to use the system. And then below, farther down on this page, is those user permissions I was talking about earlier, where people have different abilities to do different things and in the system. And you can see you can make it specific to certain forms, too, that they can do some forms, but not other ones. Or you can do it across the board for all of them, whichever works for you, whatever you need your other people to be able to do. Now, uh, I mentioned that once you have your email address locked in here, you cannot change that afterwards. You may need to, at some point, change who the account administrator is to another person. Generally, this would be a new director is coming to the library, and now they're going to be in charge of E-rates. So you need to hand it over to them. Uh, if you are having a, a transition of uh, directors, and they're giving the new directors being given all of the passwords and everything, this is very easy. You can. Um, log in here and you're the account administrator and you can get you know, make this chit, uh, this swap to a new person. Um, if the email address is a generic email address that your library uses, like so-and-so public library at Gmail, and that's the director's email, then all you need to do is go in, go into the user account, using that little head up here, and just change the name. You know, make it your the new director's name. Easy peasy. But if it's a new email address, like it is specific to a person's name, like first name, last name, at library.org, and the new director's email address is going to be different than the old one, then you're going to need to make a transfer the account administrator function to a different user. Um, the way to do this is you go in and make a new account, a new user account, like what I just showed you, for uh, the new director, and then hand over from the old to the new. Now, if you don't have the login info for the old director, that, you know, there wasn't they just didn't have everything to give to you. So you can't get into the account administrator's account to do this handover and everything. That's okay. You can just contact USAC. They have an 800 number uh, for their customer service, and they will. And you just call them and say, "Hey, I'm the new director. I need to do E-rate, and I don't have any of the old person's con you know, login info, so I need to start from scratch." And they will work with you to create you a user account in um, the library's organization account. But to do this um, handing over, if you can do that, uh, when you go in from that, the way we did for looking at news, you click on the library's name where it says welcome. And there's some buttons across the top here. And on the right, there's going to be these three dots button, and it opens up this pull down. And you're going to want to modify account administrator and the general contact. And I'll show you. As you click on that, you'll see um, it's going to list down here at the bottom all the different user accounts that are available. Um, this is something I had to do for myself when I got married and changed my name five years ago. Uh, my email address at the state changed as well. So I had to change my email address on my account in here. But as I told you, you can't change the email address. So I had to kind of fake it by creating a second account for myself and then handing over the um, administrator control from my old email address, Krista.Burns, to my new one, Krista.Porter. So I'd create a second account for myself. I go in here, change the box to the Porter one, hit continue, and it says here's the current one, here's what it's going to be. It's going to change from Krista.Burns to Krista.Porter and submit. 
and then also do the same thing under general contract contact. You have to do the account administrator and the general information as well, because there's different purposes that they um, you have to send emails to. So same thing, change it from Burns, reporter one, and hit continue. So depending on how what access you have to a previous person's information, if you need to do a handover, you may need to do this, or you may need to call, um, you may need to just create a new user with a whole new email address and then hand over and switch the uh, administrative account and get general contact. Or you may need to call USAC and say, hey, I'm new. I have no access to anything. Please help me. And they will help you do that. No problem. Now, for your library's info, uh, there is a specific time when you can do this and a certain time when you can't make changes to library's info. Uh, the time when you can do this is called the administrative window. Um, so you can update all of your information before the main processes for E-rates start in next year. Uh, it's open right now, open to October, in October, October 26th, and it will uh, close a little before the funding year um, filing window opens for Form 471. And this is something we'll get into. The first form, 470, you just do it whenever, it, at any time now. 471, the second form of the process when you're going to tell USAC what who you pick, there's only a certain amount of time um, when you can do it. It's a couple of months and it's called the filing window for the 471. When that filing window opens, all of this information about your library needs to be locked down and unchangeable because once you start submitting that, you are saying, here's what something costs, here's what my discount calculation is, now do the math to tell me, make sure you can know how much discount you're going to receive. So those numbers can't be changed. Your school lunch numbers, all um, this, the um, square footage of the library for category two, all of that has to be unchangeable once you start submitting to USAC, here's what I've done, here's what I want to go with. So that's why they have this window of time when you can make those changes and then at a point when it's locked down, you can't make any more. So make sure now just all that information is correct about your library. Pop in there, see what it says. Um, and make sure everything is correct right now. So to do your changes to your library's info, as opposed to your personal info, you go to manage organization. Same thing, you check your library name, then you do manage organization. And this is the live information about your library. Now this is a very long page and I've broken it up to each of the sections um, so we can zoom in and see all of it here. So you can change the library's name if you, you know, somebody's, like I said, donated money and it's changed. You can update that, address, um, your urban or rural status if you think it needs to be changed. Um, this latitude and longitude used to be used for keeping track of rural status and things, but as you can see, it's not required in the asterisk, so things that aren't required, you can just leave blank. Next section below that is other ways they could contact you, alternate phone number, alternate emails you can put in there. And then basic information about your library, uh, if you're a public library and main branch, those are the two basic things you should always have checked because you're you're the only branch, but you're the main. Um, and anything else here that might apply to you? Do you have a bookmark wheel? Do you have a kiosk? Something like that, you can check off as well. And then below that, the very last section is, this is where you enter that square footage for doing your Category 2 budget information. So if you're ever thinking about applying for Category 2, make sure you go in and check here and make sure that's got the correct number there so that when you do apply, it can do the math and the calculation based on that number you've entered there. This is also where your school district is, it will pop up for work, figuring out your calc um, discount calculation. Um, if it's not here or if you think it's the wrong one, there is a search feature to look up a different school district. Um, and FCC registration number. Uh, this is a number required to do business with um, the FCC. And there's links on our E-Rate website where you can look that up for your library or apply for one. So that is everything in your account, your user information, your library information. Does anybody have any questions now about anything that I've covered so far? Next, we are going to get into the actual form itself, the first form, the 470, and do, I'm going to do a screenshot demo of how that all works. So do you have any questions about anything that I've mentioned yet up till now about what's in your Epic account, how to use it, uh, what you can apply for, what the discounts are, anything like that that you want to ask? Go ahead and type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface.
No? All right. Let's go on to our form, our actual forms here. So the first form in the E-rate process is the 470. This form is officially to open a competitive bidding process. And that may seem a little uh, intimidating, but that's okay. We will get into what that all means. It's not nearly as scary as it sounds. Um, you, and this is where you say what you're looking for, what services you want to receive, uh, what type of library you are, what, what you're looking for out there. Um, so do you want to get an e-read discount on my monthly internet bills, do you have equipment I want to buy, all of, what do I want to buy, all of that. Um, everyone is required to do this to start the process, except for a couple of exceptions. If you are in the middle of a multi-year contract, so specifically a contract with a beginning and an end date, so it starts on this date and ends here, um, many times service providers will say, if, we, if you lock in and sign a, a three-year contract with us or five-year contract with us, we'll give you this um, really good rate for that entire time. So they you know, lock you in for definitely being their customer for that amount of time. So if you have that kind of thing where the contract's going to end and then after that you'll have to sign a new contract to start the next cycle, um, you do not file a 470 all the, every year of that contract, only the first year when you're reaching out to get that service. Um, you don't want to open up bidding again for something you've already contracted with somebody, a uh, company for. That would be bad. So if you're in um, one of those middle years of your multi-year contract, you do not do the 470 at all. What you do is you skip and you wait till the 471, the second form of the process, which usually comes out and comes up in the spring, and uh, just let you do that one every year. Just letting you right know, oh, yes, I'm still with that company. Yes, I'm still with that company. So you just do that every year. Also, if you can get this deal here, uh, USAC says you do not need to do a competitive bidding. Uh, they've been trying to encourage service providers to provide really good service speed at a, a really reasonable rate. So they said that uh, the rules came out saying that if you can get $300 a month or less for 100 megabits per second, then you do not have to do competitive bidding. You found a really good cost-effective uh, service, and you can just go with it. Same thing here, you just wait until the 471 and submit that saying, hey, here's what we found, here's what it's going to cost, and it meets all these criteria. Um, you can also include installation of something new that you'll be getting as well. So to do your 470, um, here on your landing page in the upper top menu here, you start with the link for the FCC Form 470. And as soon as you've clicked that, this is what I'm talking about, about a task has been created. I've done nothing yet here. I haven't entered anything. I haven't hit save to do anything. But as soon as I click that FCC Form 470 link on this landing page, a task has been started. And it will start reminding me, don't forget, work on this form. Even if I decide at this point, oh, wait, I'm not ready. I don't have all my info. Or, oh, I've been interrupted. I can't do this right now. And I just close on my browser. That task is out there nudging me. So go in here if you've got one of these floating around, and there is your discard form button on the lower left. Click on that to delete any forms that you don't really need to be floating around there still nudging you. Uh, when you To do the form, though, we do enter um, a nickname here. You can have this be anything you want. Uh, it's just for your own purposes to keep track of which form this is. Uh, it will come up whenever you're getting notified in questions. So here I just did it for last year, FY, funding year 2021, 470. And then save and continue. Save and share button there, that would be for those purposes when I was telling you if you had someone else who had to um, actually submit the form and do the certification, that is um, what you would you know, send this off to somebody else who has a user account in the system. But if it's just you doing the rate and you submitting this, you just do save and continue. Um, this next this next screen here is just showing you the basics about your entity, about your library. Double check all this. If any of it needs changing, go back out, go into your managed organization, and um, update all of that. Uh, you can see here we now also have a back button. So throughout this uh, different step, steps in this form, you can always go back one step at a time. Across the top here, you see there's a blue bar that will move along each each section of the form so you can see where you are. But you can always go back, back, back if you think you need, if you realize you need to change something. And you can always discard at any time too. But we're going to save and continue and go on. It's going to say, are you the main contract person? 
If you are, you say yes. If no, you can enter someone else's info. But if you say yes, it just pops in your user info automatically. Save and continue. And then we can choose what services we're going to ask for. Category one, you can do a FC a form 470 for category one, just for category two, or both on one form 470 if you want to. For this example, I'm doing both all together in one. <clears throat> and we save and continue. If you, you can also use an RFP or a request for proposal if you need to. If you have a really complex um, project um, that you're doing, like special construction that needs a lot of detail, and you, you have a multi-page document that explains here's everything we need, uh, you can upload that and use that in your application as well. There is some, there's a section here where you can write a little narrative in the form, but it's pretty small and not you have to give a lot of detail, it's much easier to write a Word document or write something else and just attach it to your 470. And then what you do in the form, you say, go look at that, that's got all the details you need to know. So if you do want to, you can upload that here and attach it. Or yes, and or you can say no if you're not. And then save and continue. And now we start entering our service requests, the specific um, information about what we're looking to receive an E-rate discount on, our monthly internet, our equipment, whatever. So we do the add new service request button. And this at this point here is where things have changed in the form from previous years. So if you've done E-rate before, this is where you start where you start start seeing that, that it looks different. They've done kind of a menu system here where you, they help you guide you in digging down into the different sections of what you might request. So your first choice is I am looking seeking bids for internet access or data transmission or category one network equipment or maintenance operations. Um, so this would be for your special construction. We're gonna just do a basic um, internet access, our monthly internet costs. When you click on that, it opens up another menu of some choices. Um, bids for internet access with any combination. So this first choice here is for pretty much any kind of connection you might have. And you can see it lists fiber, non-fiber, cable, DSL, copper, et cetera, et cetera. So any sort of um, internet connection we might get. Um, internet access without data transmission, and then data transmission only without internet access. These are mainly for, there's some larger organizations that have to purchase these two things kind of separately, and they've indicated it separate end here. Most of us small independent libraries don't need to worry about that. Um, and you do also have the ability to build your own network. I'm pretty sure none of us want to do that, so we're gonna not do that. We're gonna do a, uh, choose the first option there, of just give whatever kind of internet services are out there. And then this choice is, um, once you choose that, I am looking for uh, this service either by one provider or a bundled package, um, or data plans or wireless adapters, which are air cards for mobile devices. Uh, this is mainly used for things like, it could be on a bookmobile, or there are some rural areas in the country that still do not have broadband, and they have to use wireless to get the internet. Uh, you will. Uh, so um, if you do need to do that, you will have to confirm and prove to, USAC will ask you, is there no other traditional internet provider that can provide you just broadband internet? You know, why are you using a data plan? You have to you know, prove that there's nothing else available that's the only internet service available in your community. Um, so we're gonna do this though as a first choice as we just wanna go with a race traditional internet provider. And then it will ask us to give some details once you've made those choices. Uh, quantity how many is how many internet connections we want to the building. Generally, that would be one. Number of entities, we're just a single entity, one library. Um, are you looking for installation? That would depend. If this is you're just doing an E-rate application and I want to just get E-rate on the service I'm already getting, I already have, and I'm just continuing it for each year, you don't need that installed again, so you would say no. But if it's something new, you would say yes. Um, if you did have an RFP, this is where you would check and make sure that it is going to be included with this particular request. Um, and then you're going to want to ask for your speed. What speed do you want? Minimum internet speed and up to maximum speed. Uh, for doing the 470, I always tell everybody, this is your dream. <laughs> dream. Think big. What would you love to have as a speed? Uh, you don't want it to be too small a range here. Um, so you want to think, you don't know what might be available out there. So for maximum, go big, go one gigabit, five gigabits. You never know what might be available. Um, and if you don't ask, you won't get it. Uh, also, if you limit this to too much, like if you say I want 25 megabits per second minimum and only 50 megabits maximum, because that's what I get right now, 
and a company comes to you and say, actually, we can offer 100 megabits per second now. We can offer a higher speed. That's great. But because on your 470, you said the max you wanted was 50, you're only going to get an E-rate discount on half that speed, half the cost, not the full cost of the 100. So think big. You're not committed to anything on the 470. This is putting out feelers, saying, is this available? How, how much could I get? When you do your 471, the second form is when you say, this is what I actually ended up with and what I'm actually picking. So make sure this range here is as big enough as it to include anything you might potentially get as a response. Um, and you might not know what that response is, so think as big as you can. And then we save the request. This pops us back to our screen we started, and you see it started a table here with what we're looking for. Uh, we could add another request if we want to. I'm going to do one here to add in that uh, dark and lit fiber. Um, I'm seeking inter for internet access and data transmission. And in this case, I go with the um, third option, the purchase data transmission service only, not including internet access. And you'll see here, I have the second choice mentions the dark fiber strand. So this is when you're going to kind of do a feeler and see, is there any dark fiber out there available that I could get and have turned on and use for my fiber connection? You'll note here, it does include least lit and dark together and you have to do both all those little asterisks is everywhere uh, our quantity is for both just one internet connection um, our number of entities is over here on the left just one our rfp is over there do you want this installed in this case probably yes because this is going to be something new you're getting and then same thing for speed think big one meg gigabit five meg gigabits whatever and then save this request and now you can see we've got for our category one, our basic internet service, the any any particular type of connection we can get, and then looking to see if there's any least dark or lit fiber available out there. This is that narrative I was talking about. There's a little box here that you could type some details in. I just wrote in this case CISP RFP because I said I did attach here, um, but you could put some short information in there if you wanted to. There's also a question about installment payment plans. Um, if it's some large project you need to space out your payments for what you're responsible for, you could do that. So you'd say yes or no. And then save and continue. When we're done adding all of our different service requests, we save all of our category ones. And then it, because I did select category two, it pops us over to now doing all your category two requests. This is your internal connections, all of your equipment. But it works the same way as the category one. You add a new service request. Same kind of thing, it has a menu here. You can seek bids for equipment needed, the basic maintenance of that equipment, um, and operating that um, service. Uh, so you can do, the, as I mentioned before, you can do the equipment and automatically add in the basic maintenance. You may already have the equipment, but you just want to do a request for just the maintenance on it. So you could do just a basic maintenance one here. We're going to go through and do, um, we want to buy some equipment and want to make sure it gets um, maintained. So this only has one choice. I seek bids for equipment. But then you've got this pull-down menu of all the types of equipment that you could ask for. So your cables, racks, switches, wireless access points, uh, power supplies, etc. So for the first example here, I picked cabling, so the cable that I need. I said I want a, in the units here is feet. I want a thousand feet to run through my new library or my new computer room. I don't know if that's the right amount, but that's just my example. Um, you can also choose a specific manufacturer if you know of one. Uh, you don't have to. You can just leave this up to the service provider. But if you have a preference, you can. You'll note it does say or equivalent. And we'll say that in every single one of these. You definitely want that included there because if they can't use this particular manufacturer, they need to have the ability to use someone else or some other brand. Um, and you, if you don't have that or equivalent, it will not you won't be able to get the E-rate discount. So to, to eliminate that issue, they automatically says always are equivalent. <coughs> you are one entity. Yes, I would like someone to install this. I don't know anything about running cable. And if I had RFP. Now here's that button I was talking about that. Please select this option if you would like to create an accompanying category two and BMIC is the abbreviation acronym for basic maintenance of this internal connection request. So I check that box, it uh, automatically just takes the, my item to the top and fills it in down there. So now in one shot here, I'm saying I want the equipment and I want the basic maintenance and upkeep of that. 
I save, and now I've got two items come into the table for category two, the equipment itself and the basic maintenance of it. And then you can see all the details here. Now, if I want some other pieces of equipment, I can just add new service requests and keep adding them um, as I want, as I other things I might be buying this next year. Now, this is up to you about what you want to buy in each year of that five years that you have available to use. You don't have to do it all at once. You can. Um, some libraries do. I'm updating all my switches this year, so I'm just buying like three switches. And then next year, I'll buy some new routers. And the year after that, we'll update the cabling. Um, so you can spread it out that using that budget over multiple years if you want to, or do it all at once. Maybe you're building a new library or a new, or just updating your computer lab, whatever. Uh, for this, I've gone through and I've done a bunch of ad additional ones. I'm not going to show you doing all those because they all work the same way as the one we just saw. But in the end, you'll end up with this long list, if you did multiple ones, of each piece. Here I did, I needed, wanted a router and its basic maintenance. I would like to buy three new wireless access points and I need a new switch too. And all the basic maintenance is long. <laughs> along for those. I also have a little narrative down here if I wanted to enter any more information in there, or I could have attached RFPs, depends. Um, so once I've got everything listed here that I wanted for category two, and I'm done adding service requests, I go down and save and continue. It will then ask me if I have a technical contact, anyone who I want to, is there someone else at the library or someone else in the community who is the techie person that I would prefer these service providers to talk to um, rather than me because I don't know the answers to the questions and they would do it better. If there's not and it's just you, you can say no, but if it is, um, you can have give them a user account if they have a need to be in your E-rate system. If they don't need that, they just are there to answer calls and questions, you can just enter it manually, and that's what I've done here, entered in the contact info and the name for my tech person. And then save and continue. If there are any state or local rules about competitive bidding, if you have any of this in your town or your municipality, you would have to know that, um, and you would say yes, and then you can upload the document, if the document it will let you do that, or link to something. Um, I'm just saying no, we don't have anything statewide that would apply to this. And all now that's everything entered into the form, and we can now review it to see um, how it all looks. When you hit that review form 470 button, it is now on the USAC server side. It's working on creating and generating a PDF that you can look at and look over. Uh, it says here, when it's ready, a task will become available, and you click up here in the tasks to um, go to it. Now this can actually take a minute or two, like literally 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds to generate. And you may click on tasks and don't see it there yet. Just refresh your page, keep doing that every 20, 30 seconds or so, and eventually it will pop up. It does take an actual bit of time to create that PDF. It's not instantaneous. But once you do check on there, click on there, once you see the one that says certify, and that's the it's there and it's ready for you to actually finish the last step in the process. So click on certify and it will give you now a link to download it, to open up and look at it as a PDF and you'll notice there's the certification buttons over here and this one is not a bright blue it's kind of light blue you can't use it yet. Uh, you have to check in this box to certify that everything in the PDF is correct before it will let you go on to certification. Um, this send for certification this is also confusing I think Send for certification, that is sending to someone else, another user in your account. This is what I was talking about with if one person is allowed to complete the information, but only another person, a different person is the only one um, authorized to submit. That's the certifying part, is actually signing off on all the legal stuff. That's what you would do. But if you're just the one person who does E-rate, you just continue. Um, you don't have to look at this PDF if you don't want to. I and mean, if we just filled all this in and we know it's all good, you can just check the box and go on. But if you do want to look at it, you just click on it and it opens it up And um, as a PDF. It says draft on the top of every page, and it just shows you everything that you entered in the form for your reference. But if we sure everything is correct, then we check in the box, and you'll notice the light blue becomes dark blue, and we can actually click on this continue to certification button. It says, are you sure you want to go? Yes, we do. And then this is all the legally stuff that you have to agree to. Um, you have to check every single one of these boxes before we'll let you finish certifying and submitting the form. 
You'll notice at the bottom, the certify button, once again, is a light blue and it's not going to be clickable. I'm going to zoom in here to show you. Um, this is just all the legal things saying that you are allowed to, you are authorized to do this. You promise that you will follow all the E-rate rules, that you've done everything correctly, and you have to check every single box. Once you have checked every single box, the blue button, the certified button will become clickable and you'll click it and it will say, are you, the scary legal, legal thing comes up saying that false statements may result in civil liability or criminal prosecution. I'm sure you guys aren't doing anything illegal with E-rate. <laughs> click yes. And then um, it's done. It just pops you back to your tasks where you started that certification and year 470 is submitted. Yay. Now, if you wanted to, and now if you want to get the final version of this in a PDF, many, many people do like to have um, their own copy of it. Even though it's here in the system, you feel safer having your own either printed out or downloaded and saved on your computer. Um, this is where I say I recommend go and do this um, PDF, not that draft one. You don't want the draft one because that's just your draft. You want the final one that says you've actually submitted it. So if we go back to our landing page. Um, anywhere where you see this USAC logo, you can click on, it'll bring you back to your landing page. I'm going to go down to the very bottom of the page where we do that search for FCC forms. I'm going to look for our 470 and for the funding year that we're doing. And uh, look at the status here. Once it says certified, you can go and get the PDF. It may take, um, just like their um, PDF for the draft, it can take some time for this status to be updated updated and actually in their system. Um, I Most often I go to this too quickly and um, I get over here and it says incomplete and I panic a little because, but I just did the 470, I know I did, that's okay. Same as before with your task, just refresh the page, run the search again, run the search again. It may take 30 seconds, a minute. Eventually it will come up saying certified and then you know it's been submitted. You can click on the nickname. This is a hot link here and that brings you to the form online. But up here at the top, there's a generated documents link. And this is where you can get the PDF. You click on original version. And it opens up, looks very similar, just doesn't say um, draft at the top. And at the bottom, there's all the certifications that you agreed to. And at the very bottom is your signature where it lists you and the actual time step of the date and time that you submitted the form. This is important because, as I mentioned, you do have to wait those 28 days before you can go on to do the second form in the process. You need to, that's you know, when you submitted this starts off that whole timing. Once you have, and then that P, that PDF you can save, download, uh, print out, whatever you like to do with your uh, copies of these. Uh, once that's submitted, you receive a receipt notification in your newsfeed. Um, you can make changes if you need to to the form. If you realize, oops, I made mistakes, I, I, I forgot to do part, whatever, you can do that. Um, and it also tells you what is the, what they call that allowable contract date. That's the date 28 days after the 470 is submitted. That's the earliest that you can do your 471. For, you can make your decision and make your choices. You have to give, the FCC rules say you have to give 28 days amount of time for companies to reach out to you. So this is your, in your news item, um, you look for your own news and right there is the allowable contract date letting you know when you can go on to the next step. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Anybody have any questions? So that is our 470 submitted. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions um, about the 470? Any parts of it, things you can apply for? Go ahead and type into the question section. So after you have submitted your form 470, you have opened up your competitive bidding process. And what is this? What is competitive bidding? Uh, competitive bidding is a formal process to pick who, what service providers you're going to go to and decide what products you're going to receive. Um, it may sound a little um, intimidating, but it's not nearly as uh, bad as it seems. <laughs> um, as I mentioned earlier, you do have to give at least 28 days from the date you submit your 470 for this competitive bidding to happen. Um, this is the time for service providers to uh, see what you asked for, uh, send you their bids, um, reach out to you with questions, 
Um, you can look at the offers, compare them, look at them, um, and then select the most cost-effective bid for yourself. So before you can make your final decision, though, you do got to wait those 28 days. Uh, but you may receive bids, you may receive questions, and you are able to uh, answer those throughout the um, this 28 days or even after if you want to. You must, during your competitive bidding process, have what they call a fair and open bidding process. This means that you cannot have any, uh, give any vendor uh, extra information. All of them must be treated the same and have access to the same info. So if one vendor asks you a question that maybe affects how other vendors may respond and you've been in contact with other um, vendors, you have to make sure that you update them with the new information as well. Um, vendors cannot be involved in your 470 and in, in writing that um, app and submitting that or putting the information in there. Uh, you have to, that would be given, you know, you can't reach out to some company and say, hey, I want to do E-rate and I'm going to be submitting a 470. What should I put in the form that you, you know, that you guys, you all offer? You cannot do that. You can contact, look at companies' websites, see what's out there to get an idea. You can talk to some IT people if you're at the commission or your own people. You can contact a vendor and just ask what they offer, but you cannot mention it in context of doing E-rate. You cannot say, I'm doing E-rate and I need to know what to put on my form. You can just say, hey, I'm interested in what your services are and what your costs might be or what you have available if you want to get an idea ahead of time. You can do that, but they cannot be involved in making, deciding you know, what you're going to have actually on your 470. Uh, you also must choose what is the most cost-effective bid out of everyone if you do receive multiple bids, and cost being the, with cost being the primary factor. Uh, now, as as you've probably you know experienced in life, uh, cost cost effective doesn't always mean cheapest. Um, we've all bought the cheapest thing because we thought that'd be a great idea, and it turns out not so good in the end, uh, and that's okay. Uh, you have a um, you'll document how you do this, how you determine what you think is the most cost-effective bid. Uh, and I have an example here um, from me rate of a, a bid evaluation that you can use if you want to. If you do have multiple vendors contact you, offering you with the same service, you can use this um, if you want to as a way of um, comparing and contrasting them and deciding who to go with. Now, per EUSAC rule, for, per FCC rules, price has to be the primary factor. Um, but that doesn't mean the biggest, you know, 50% of your decision making it just has to be the primary, the price. So here what I've done is I've taken the things that are important to me, things that I think, and you could have this be anything you, if there's something different you want to put in here. Um, the things that I'm going to use, the criteria I'm going to use to decide if I like this vendor over a different one. Um, they have ability to win, earn up to 100 points, and I've given price 30 points. It's worth more points in total than anything else that makes it the primary factor. And then everything else I've decided, you know, they, they get the certain amount. Um, prior experience with a vendor could be I know them and I've worked with them before. Could be I've never heard of them. Um, could be I know them and I know they have, they're not so good. Uh, how they do their invoicing, if they're local, if they're good in the environment, whatever you think is important to you, um, you can have your criteria. And then um, after those 28 days are over, you can then see, um, look at the different bids you've gotten and assign the points appropriately and see what you come up with. Uh, and you'll see here in this example, vendor two, the cheapest one, because they earned a full 30 points for price, being the best price, is not the actual best choice when it comes to being the most cost effective and everything else is important to you. Vendor three ended up with 92 points. Uh, and you can see the big, uh, important part here was prior experience with this vendor. It may be my current vendor, it may be somebody I know in town, whatever. Um, vendor two, even though they were cheapest, they got zero in prior experience. That could be they're new, never heard of them before, there's some company I don't know, or it could be I do know them and I have experience or knowledge that they have really bad customer service, so I don't want to go with them. Whatever the reasoning is, all of these things are subjective, what you think about them. Um, so some of these things are subjective, actually being local or not <laughs> in prices, but that can be your, you know, it's not all just cut and dry. So in this case, I go with vendor three. Um, as far as, and then if you do have to do this kind of thing and do a comparison, you're going to want to save this. You need documentation showing why you chose one vendor over another. 
Um, this is because vendor two here who knows that they may know, I know that I'm the cheapest, they could come back to you or they could go to USAC and say, hey, I know I'm the cheapest. How could they possibly choose in that other company? That's, that's not right. That can't be correct. You have this showing why you chose and why they weren't selected and you're good. That covers you. You don't have to worry about any having done anything wrong um, for E-rate purposes. So this is something you would save and keep also for those um, those ten years too, just in case. Now, there's some situations that you um, uh, you don't always you're not always going to have comp competition either. Um, so this is only if you have multiple bids for the same thing. Now, some special cases that you might encounter, well, if you have an existing contract. You already have a contract you're in with or the company, um, you're doing E-rate for the first time, and you want, so you don't want to open up a new bidding process and start from scratch, but you want to start doing E-rate. Uh, you do your 470 for whatever the services you're looking for, as usual. Um, wait your 28 days, but then you use whatever your current contract is as one of your bid responses. If you have multiple, you have to can then compare it to the other ones and hopefully your current bid comes up with the most points. Um, obviously, they do well in that category of prior experience and any other things. Uh, and then your existing contract can be the winning bid, and now you can go on with saying that's who, who we're going with. Uh, another question, what if the city pays for the library's internet? The library doesn't pay for it themselves. You can still do E-rate. Just because the city's paying for it, it does, it does not mean you can't do E-rate. You just have to cost allocate out the part that is the, um, the library's internet as opposed to every other department's internet. So you have to separate, be able to somehow know which part, which how much of the internet is used by the library or the library is responsible for or the library pays the city for in some way. Um, you can have an estimate of use. You might have actual statistical data that shows here's the internet connection and this much goes to city hall, this much goes to the fire department and this much goes to the library. And then you just apply for E-rate on the amount that goes to the library. Um, your bill might be able to be separated out from the provider showing how much cost each, each, each location is costing, is using, so you have an actual monetary number. Um, so you can totally do E-rate even if the city's paying for it. Um, just as long, you just have to be able to know which part of that internet yet is the library's responsibility or the, what the library is using. You have to be able to do that. And what if you have only one bid or zero bids? That's okay. You don't actually have to have a competitive bidding process. If there's only one company in town, that's who you go with, and that's fine. Um, just get yourself a note or an email or something saying this is the only company in town or this is the only one that contacted us, and that's why we're going with them. Um, if you didn't receive any bids, nobody contacted you, and it's after your 28 days, then you can reach out to companies and say, hey, reach out to vendors and you know, let them know, hey, I know you're out there and I did an E-rate application. Can you please send me something <laughs> so I can potentially use you? Um, your current provider sometimes assumes you're just going to continue with them and they don't always proactively respond to these. Shoot them a little email or phone call just confirming they're still doing it. They still want to do E-rate just, you know, just to document that everything is uh, still going to be going on as, as it has been. So once you wrap up your competitive bidding on or after your allowable contract date, you can close the competitive bidding process. You can pick, you can pick a particular date and say, as of this date, I'm not looking at any other bids. Um, as long as it's past those 28 days, uh, you can say, this date, I'm done. Even if something comes in after that, someone responds late, it's you as the applicant to decide, this is my process, and you, you came in too late, I've already made my choice. But you evaluate your bids, you pick who you're going with, you sign a contract or an agreement, whatever it, they need, and then you go on to the second step of the process, which is submitting the 471. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, only you can only do your 471 during your application filing window, which um, will open sometime earlier, early in the next year. So what could potentially happen is you do your 470. If you get on it pretty early in the process in September, October, you submit it, you wait your 28 days, you've got your bids, you've made your choice. That's great. You have to wait though till the 471 is available in after January. Um, in the beginning of the year to do the second step of the process. So there's a lot of uh, submit, submit, and wait <laughs> in E-rate. 
So the second form of the E-rate process is the Form 471. And you must do this one. This one you do have to do every single year. And this is, you use this form to tell USAC which company you've picked and what services you're going to get from them and how much it's going to cost. Uh, your discount calculation is, is included in here now on this form. And you certify um, doing all the rules. At this point, you can talk to your service provider about the fact that you're doing E-rate. In fact, you're probably going to need to, to make sure you have all the information you need from them to tell USAC what you're actually going to get from the provider. So at this point, once you have decided on who you're going with, then you can have, they can, they can help you with filling in the information in the 471, putting in the right uh, equipment they might need to be getting for you, putting in the right range, uh, speeds of, and cost of internet service, anything else. Um, that you might need to enter that they would know. Um, also, you want to talk to them about how you want to receive your discount, your desired invoicing. Do you want discounts on your bills or do you want to um, pay in full and get reimbursed afterwards? Make sure you have that conversation with them, especially if you want discounts on, their bill, on your bills so that they know that. Now, when can you file the form? Just and This is a very important reminder. I know I've mentioned this a lot, but you have to wait those 28 days. If you jump ahead and it hasn't been the 20 days and you submit your 471 early, you will be uh, denied and you will be knocked out of getting e at all for the next funding year. So I cannot stress enough, do not do it too early. Uh, you can still submit your 471 um, or your 470 until during the filing window of the 471. The 471 filing window usually goes from mid-January to mid-March, so about three months worth. And there's 28 days within there. Um, the question many um, libraries ask me is, what's the deadline for the 470? Well, the deadline of the 470 would be whatever is the end date of the filing window, back up 28 days. That's the latest you can possibly submit a 470 and still have 28 days before submitting your 471, if you're going to do it on the very last day. So you can be doing your 470 still in January, February, potentially. Just make sure you wait those 28 days and make sure you do it in plenty of time for that deadline of, of the end, the close of the 471 filing window. So you have to wait 20 days, sign some sort of agreement. So before doing the 471, you do have to agree um, that you're going to go with this company. Uh, in a contract, you can have a clause, and we do recommend this if it's something you're concerned about, that process, this agreement will not go forward unless we are approved for E-rate funding. Uh, for things like major construction projects, like special construction, we definitely recommend that as being a clause in your contract. You, know, you do have to sign something with them, but you can have this kind of criteria of, but if we don't get E-rate, we can't afford this, so the whole thing is um, not going to happen. Um, and then you do have to wait for that filing window. We do not know what the filing window dates is yet. Uh, it, there are specific dates each year, but USAC doesn't usually announce them until later in December, near the end of December. So uh, look for notifications from me. I will send out on our emails. It will come out from USAC. It will be on our websites of what the filing window dates are. So then you'll know what you're talking about for ultimate deadlines for the upcoming funding year. Uh, what's nice that USAC does do now, they send you, they proactively send you an email letting you know when your allowable contract date has been reached. Uh, and this goes directly to your email address. This is not something just in your Epic account. They have to log in and check and see if you got it, if it's been sent. Uh, it is sent to you right to your email address. And it says you the allowable contract date has been reached. You may now close your competitive bidding process and uh, work on the for um, making your choices and deciding to be able to do your 471. So look for this email before you even decide to finalize every, anything. You should get something from USAC after those 28 dates. Um, it is also entered into your news section in your Epic account as well. Um, pretty much everything is, is in there, but I think it's really nice and helpful now that they send this. because we I've got always got libraries saying, I don't know what my date is, I can't remember, has it come up yet? Just wait and you'll get an email from USAC saying, you're good to go, go on to the next step. So do your 471. It is up here in the top menu items as well as like the 470. Um, as I mentioned, though, the filing window is not open right now, so I can't actually get screenshots and show you step-by-step um, step how to do it. However, 
on the USAC website, they have really good videos, and this is what I really depend on for myself and for you, step-by-step uh, -step showing how to do a lot of these forms, and they update them every year. Um, you know, internally, they're able to put these together. So I highly recommend you go and watch their videos if you want to know how to do these forms um, and these other forms um, that I don't have screenshots of the whole process. Um, they're very similar, though, the 470, the 471. Uh, there is some specifics, though, about the 471 that I want to highlight uh, to bring to your attention when you are in there that you things you should need to be aware of. Uh, first, for the 471, you must file a separate one for each category of service. So for category one, if you're doing both category one and category two, you want to receive funding for both of those in the same funding year, you're going to have to do two 471. You could, you were able to do them both together in one 470, but when it comes to the 471, this is where it's going to be deciding what your discount's going to be and how much funding you're going to get. And because the category one is done with just a basic, here's your discount, you get that month, amount off, and category two uses that budget calculation, they have to be done separately so that the system will do the math differently. So if you're doing both categories in the same year, you will have to do two 471s. Also, there are two steps, a two-step process for adding all of your information into your funding requests within this. Um, with the 470, you saw we did a service request, and just in one shot, we were able to enter all the details. With the 471, you enter all the details about what you're getting, but then you've got a second step where you have to enter the amount it's going to cost, the, um, the line item information what's that, is what that's called. Uh, oftentimes, this is where people kind of lose it. They do their funding request, they see it comes up in that little table, and they say, yeah, under the next part of the form. And it throws out errors. It says it can't submit it. <laughs> and it's because you haven't gone into that item now and added in the, the, the monetary amount, the cost. So one way to remember this is if I haven't entered a money amount yet, I haven't finished this, doing this form. That's why I'm getting errors. So it is a little more detailed you go to that extra step than when you do the 470. Um, so you do your step one, adding if it's your monthly internet access, it's, if it's your uh, special construction. For your category two one, you'd enter different funding requests for each piece of equipment that you're doing. And then once you have them in a table, you click on them again, and it will ask you for the more detailed information of exactly how much it's going to cost. After you submit your 471, just like the 470, you'll get a receipt acknowledgement that's in your Epic account in your news section. You can make some minor correct changes or corrections if you need to, if you did a typo or a math error or something. Um, this is what's also great about E-Rate is even after you've submitted it, both the 470 and the 471, it's not in stone. You can make sh fixes or change the corrections um, if you realize that something went wrong. Um, you can also outright cancel an app with a form and redo a whole new one if you want to. Uh, you just you know, contact USAC and say, I don't want to use that 470 or that 471. It, it's, it's, uh, it's wrong. Can you cancel it? And I'll do a whole fresh one. And that's perfectly fine. Um, you can also do some changes if you realize the cost was wrong or different, um, but you can only reduce funding and not increase it if you're making a change. If you realize you do need to do an increase because you did it wrong, this is, that would be a case of contact USAC, please cancel that 471, I have to do a whole brand new one. And they will do that, take to that, um, go through that process for you. Um, and here is your receipt acknowledgement letter in your Epic account, uh, just showing you everything. And you've got some links here where you can see what the form actually looks like. So after your 471 is submitted, then your form goes to application review. This is where the Program Integrity Assurance Department, that part of USAC, PIA review, uh, looks at your application. And then they check on and make sure everything is correct. Are you eligible? Are the services eligible? Did you enter all the right information? They may reach out to you with questions. Uh, you'll receive an email saying they have an inquiry. And they generally give 14 days for you to reply, so make sure you do. Um, this is a point where you will more light, likely than not reach out to me for help as well, and that's what I'm here for, absolutely. Um, they generally send these long documents and questions that you know are very convoluted to ask like a once, you know, very simple question, and I can translate from USACIS, like a, as I like to talk, uh, to, to describe it to English and to explain to you exactly what they're looking for. 
Um, what more information do they need? Uh, sometimes they want to help you fix a mistake you made. They realized, oh, you said this in the 470, but this in the 471, and they don't match up. We'll give you a chance to fix that. So mistakes you miss, you're not totally just knocked out because you made a mistake. They want to give you this money, and they want to help you get through it, um, get through the process. So they may end up you know, saying, hey, I noticed this looks a little wrong. Let's fix it. Uh, this review process for the, so many applications they get can sometimes take months to go through. It is not instantaneous. They've got so many applications to do. Uh, and sometimes months being they don't even get to an application until after the funding year officially starts. Some people don't hear back from PIA review or back about their application answer until August, September, October, November. And yes, that is past the beginning of the funding year, which is um, July 1st. However, that's okay. Even if you don't hear from them until later in the year and you're in the funding year, you will receive your full discount going back to July 1st. You just get a big credit on your bills if you need to, if you're doing that. So you do also need to then be prepared to potentially pay your bills in full, just in case USAC doesn't get to approving it until later um, in the fall. So you'll, if you're usually receiving discounts on your bills until they've approved it, your provider won't continue discounting them after the refunding year starts. They've got to wait for each year to be approved. When you are approved, uh, USAC sends a funding commitment decision letter. This is, in, this is still called a letter because they have that acronym, but it's not a mail letter that's sent in the mail. It's actually emailed to you. And this will tell you if you've been funded or not, if it's been reduced for whatever reason. Uh, you might receive more than one of these. Uh, for example, if you did more than one, uh, 471, because you did Category 1 and Category 2. So keep your eyes open to make sure you have them both. Uh, and you can file an appeal if you want to. If you are denied or if they reduce your funding for some reason and you don't agree with their decision, uh, you can do that. Uh, there's information on the E-Rate website about how to do that. Um, and I can help you with that too if you need. I've done that a couple of times over the years with some libraries to um, submit appeals and then get them their funding. So this is an email that's, as I said, sent directly to you, not just in your Epic account. And it will say in the subject, USAC Funding Commitment Decision Letter Available. Um, the email in its email itself doesn't say what they've said. There's attachments. So there'll be a PDF that has you've been approved or not. Um, but this also then does tell you uh, what you can do as your next steps. Uh, and the next form is doing your 486. So it doesn't tell you this is the next form you need to do in the process, the 486, and letting them know that you do want to receive your funding. Um, this is a PDF. It's the funding commit decision letter. You can see how much it was committed to you and also in the letter itself it also says here's your next steps and the next form you have to do there's information about how to request uh how to submit an appeal if you need to and then some specifics about your funding commitment what it was for the actual service request um, what the speed what everything you're asking for and the amount you're going to get Now, as soon as you receive your funding commitment decision letter, you should immediately, or as soon as possible, sit down and submit your 486. There is no need to wait. There is no delay. There is no, you have to wait a certain number of days. There's no filing window when you can only do this. It is something you can do right away. Um, this is also something where a lot of libraries, again, lose it in the process. Uh, you receive this funding commitment letter that says, yes, you've been funded. Um, you're receiving your E-rate discount, yay, and you say, yes, I did it, I got my money. Well, not exactly. What that letter actually means is they have approved your application and your money's um, being held for you, but you have to let them know you actually want it. And that's what the 46 is, saying, yes, we're going to get that service, and yes, we would like to receive the funding. If you don't do the 46, they won't be able to start working on giving you the discounts or give you the reimbursements or anything. Now, why would you not want your funding? Um, sometimes things can change. You know, you start this process in the fall and you don't learn until the next fall. Costs may have gone up. So companies may have no longer exist. Who knows um, what could have happened? You may have decided to go to a totally different service because something new is um, available to you, for you. So uh, definitely look at it. You know, there's reasons you might. 
But if you are going to do it, you submit your 486 to notify them that the services have or will be starting. Um, you comply with your SIPA. This is also one of the easiest forms in the whole E-rate process to do because all of the information is already in your account and it auto fills the form. Everything in the 486 is from your 471 that you submitted and that ESAC approved where they um, have so you just need to go into the 46, find the info, click the box that said, yes, I want all these things. There's actually almost hardly anything that you have to actually uh, you know, enter yourself. It's just, yes, confirming that I want all these things you've already approved. So it's kind of interesting, ironic, that 46 is like the simplest and easiest form to submit and the one that most, office li most often libraries miss because they think, hey, I've got my funding. So I'll show you here, 46, up at the top of the form or top of your app landing page is a link to submit that. Uh, similar to the other ones, you give it a nickname, you choose the funding year, you choose yourself as the contact person on this first page, and then continue. And then on the very next page, there's some search options here if you want to look up your different applications. But by default, based on that funding year you put in the beginning, it will show you the different funding requests that you had submitted and you're approved for on your 471. And here the status is funded, what the nickname was, so you know what it was you're applying for. Uh, you'll notice here, there's here's a list of the ones that are available, and then there's a section down here that says selected funding requests, FRNs, and there's nothing here. So what we have to do is pick them in the top section and move them to the bottom, and so that we select them. So by doing that, we can check in a box for one and hit the add one button. Uh, you can add all of them. There's a button here if you just wanted everything. Um, you can check in all the boxes. So multiple ways to do it, but choose the one you want. And you'll see now it duplicates that particular one in the selected option. In this case, I'm doing this 46 just for the first funding request, not the second one. But you can see now that's duplicated down here. And now I can continue on and get, say I want that funding. Hit continue, and we've got our certifications. Uh, in this case, uh, the first two here are just the basic legalese that we have to enter. We have to agree to, so you have to check both of those. But then underneath that is our SIPA certification. And this is where it's important. There are three different choices for um, how you can say you are in compliance with SIPA. The first one is, I am completely in compliance. The second one is, I am working on becoming compliant. And the third one is, um, I SIPA does not apply to me because what I'm up uh, is not required because what I'm applying for does not require SIPA compliance. Um, this third option is mainly for it's kind of a holdover from when you could receive an E-rate discount on telephone services. Um, they eliminated that eliminated that as an um, E-rate discount uh, a few years ago, but uh, some forms are still people are still working on some old applications, so that is still an option. Uh, the working on one in the middle there is for because ERI will give you up to three years to become SIPA compliant. They know that it can be potentially uh, a difficult process, confusing, figuring out what to get, getting everything installed. So they give you some time to do that. It doesn't have to be right away. Um, you have up to three years. So for two years in a row, you could say, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. But by the third year, you've got to choose, change and be selecting the I am in compliance. If you don't do that, you'll have to give back the funding that discount that you received from the first two years because you didn't eventually become compliant. So make sure you're going to be good to go if you're in um, process. Now, we have had some people have some issues with the certifications where they know they clicked the right one and then it turns out it gets submitted and the, the, the for some reason it checked the I am not in compliance option. Sometimes that could be human error. It seems to happen too often for that. There's technical weirdness going on, who knows. If you do the wrong certification, once again, it's not in stone and you're not out of luck. USAC will notice this and they will reach out to you from their reviewers. This form gets reviewed as well, saying, hey, you said you're not in compliance, but you're requesting e discounts on internet service. Would you like to change that? Let's help you do that. And they will um, work on that with you. Uh, when it comes to this kind of question or the PIA reviews, uh, these are times, like I said, where I can help you. Um, I am, when they send you those emails, sometimes I am notified, I'm copied on those emails, um, and if I am, but not always. 
if I am copied, I will hope more often than not look at your um, inquiry, whether it's from your original review or something like this, and proactively reach out to you and say, hey, I looked at this and I read through it and this is what they're asking for. So you may receive an email from me saying, hey, uh, here's what you need to do. Uh, but they don't always copy me. I don't know why. <laughs> um, if you don't see me copied on something that you've gotten, um, that's okay. Just reach out to me yourself and um, say, hey, I got this and I'm not sure what to answer. Can you help me? And forward me what, you, what they've sent you and I will help you out with it. So can't always guarantee I get copied on these things. I haven't even been able to figure out the rhyme or reason and why sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. Um, but like I said, everything is you can work with them on and I can help you deal with any of these kind of things. So once you've got these certifications done here on your 486, you go to preview the form and this gets you um, same kind of thing as other forms. You can get a PDF and finish doing all your certifications of it. Uh, you also receive a notification letter when this form is submitted. Every time you submit a form, you get a confirmation back from USAC. So you always have a back and forth with them on everything. Um, they also send a copy of this to your service provider so that they know also that you have submitted this and they can then start working if you're going to be getting discounts on your bills. They can start working on that or continuing doing that. Um, it's also sent into your E-Rate um, Productivity Center in your news section in there. There is a deadline to submit the 486 bot. Uh, the deadline is either 120 days after service starts, so um, service start date of being, if it is July 1st, or after the date of the funding commitment decision letter, whichever is later. So if they don't get to that funding commitment decision until later in, in the year, 20, 120 days after that. Uh, now, if it is the standard July 1st, you've got your funding commitment right beforehand, uh, October 29th becomes the deadline for submitting your 486. USAC will send you some reminders about this, a reminder, but I also do this proactively as well. In the beginning of October, I will start looking at all the E-rate applications that have been done, and I will look to see if you've done a 486. And if you haven't, I will send you an email saying, hey, uh, the deadline's coming up, and you need to get this form in, otherwise you may not receive your full funding. Uh, so I will... Um, this is part of my job here. I'll try and help make sure you get the form in. Now, submitting your 486 late is not um, the end of the world. It's not like if you miss a deadline, you're out of luck. The way it works is for Ellen, for the number of days you are late, your discount will be reduced. So, for example, if you submit it a week later, a week after the deadline, you will receive seven days less of your full year's worth of your discount. Not too much if you miss it by a week or two um, compared to the whole year's worth of funding. So you do not get completely wiped out of not getting your E-rate if you're a little late. You'll just receive slightly less. Um, but like I said, I will send you a reminder in the beginning of October saying, hey, you didn't do this. You better get this in so that you can make sure you get your discount. Now, the final form in the E-rate process is the, they call it the invoicing, telling USAC how you want to receive your funding. And there's two different versions of this form depending on how you're going to get it, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the first is receiving discounts on your bills automatically from your service provider. This is the service provider invoice form, also called the SPY form. It's form 474. So the service provider will submit this if you discuss with them and decided they're just going to discount your bills and they submit this form then to use that to be reimbursed what they're discounting you. If this is what you're going with, you're done with your E-rate process with the 486 and you don't have to do anything else. It's up to your provider. However, maybe that doesn't work out for you. They can't do that. You can do reimbursement after you pay your bills in full instead. And in this case, you would submit the bare form, the Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement Form, or the 472. Uh, you can do this month by month if you want to. Every month, pay a bill and submit a bare form one at a time. That can be a lot of hassle. Or you can wait and just do the whole year, and then after the funding year is over, um, after June, submit one bare form for everything. There's also a uh, deadline for this. It's a coincidentally also at the end of October. Um, it's 120 days after the last service date, which is June 30th, or 120 days, 120 days after the date of whenever you did your 486. Uh, now, if it is that June 30th, then I will also reach out to you about this in the beginning of October, earlier in October. So 
Um, you may receive two different emails from me. I would I separate it out so you have both of them to, to deal with. I may send you an email about the 4A6 saying for the current year, you haven't done your 4A6 yet, you might want need to do that. For the previous year, I will send you a message saying, hey, according to the USAC database, you have not received um, submitted, nothing's been submitted um, for how you're receiving your funding. Uh, you might want to do a bare form. Now, the only weirdness about this one is sometimes, for some reason, service providers don't always get their SPI forms in right away. The funding year may end. They may have been discounting your bills the whole year, and they still haven't submitted and asked USAC for their money back. Um, I can't tell if that's the situation. I can't tell if they've discounted your bills. So I will still send you an email saying, hey, you haven't done your invoicing according to the according to USAC. Neither of these two forms have been submitted. If you want your money, you might need to do this bare. However, and I do say this in the email, if your bills have been getting discounted, you're okay. Just check your bills. If they're getting discounted, you're fine on your end. It's up to it's a service service provider's responsibility to get their money back. You don't have to do anything about that. You could be nice if you wanted to and nudge them and say, "Hey, don't forget to get your money back," um, but it's not your responsibility at all. It's theirs. So um, you might get a multiple emails from me about the previous year and the current year, depending on if you um, haven't gotten submitted forms and the deadlines are coming up at the end of October. Now, there's a, a bit more information that you need to do if you are going to do bare forms to get a reimbursement. It is a direct reimbursement from USAC. It is a direct um, electronic transfer. They do not issue checks to you. So, you do have to give them your banking information and you use the form 498 to do this. This form you only have to do once and then it's in their system for the whole, for the future. So, you do not have to do this every single year. If you're ever thinking of you might do reimbursements and you're not even sure, just get this information in there when you have a free time so that it's ready for you because it can take some time for this 498 to be processed and approved. I'm talking like a couple of weeks. And if you don't want to delay being able to do your bear form and get your money, you want to just have this information in there ready to go. Um, it's your basic banking information, uh, routing number, account number, etc. They do need your federal employer ID number, your tax ID that is used either by the library or the city for payroll. They also will ask for a Dunn's number. This is a Dunn, um, Dunn and Bradstreet. It's a number, another, number, another number used to do business. Uh, we've been using it recently this year for different grants as well. Um, you can get one for free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, you can go on the Dunn's um, Dun & Bradstreet website to look up and see if you or your city already has one. Um, you can use either or apply for one. Um, applying for one of these is usually pretty quickly, so that uh, doesn't take too long. Uh, the processing of the 498 from USAC can take time. So to submit your 498, it is not a form you use regularly, so it's not up here with these other three. It's actually in that menu items under um, when you hit welcome and go into your library's info. So you hit uh, your library, click your library's name over here. And on your menu items, you choose related actions and this giant list of things you can do comes up. And somewhere down in there, it will say create a FCC form 498. Now, if you haven't done this yet, you'll see that option there. If you have already done this, it's been a few years that you that they were, have been doing this direct deposit and you might have done this or someone else had done this previously before your time you don't know if you don't see the option that means it's already been done so once you submit that 498 that option is removed from this list of related actions as, some, as a something that you can do um, but when you go on that same kind of thing you give it a nickname and then you just start entering entering your library information and your numbers and everything I'm not going to go through all this. I don't have actual bank account numbers to do, but it's you know your basic information. As you can see here, financial information, organization numbers, all those basic information. Well, after you submit your 498, they will send you an email, which is just an email directly to you, asking for um, documentation. Just like doing a direct deposit of something, you have to give them either a copy of a voided check or a copy of a bank statement or a statement from that about that bank account. They have you submit this to a separate database, a separate system. It's not connected to E-rate, so for security, it's kept something somewhere completely different. So you use that link in the email to submit that documentation. 
Um, and then it can take some time for USAC to get that documentation, look over everything and approve it. Eventually you will get then a notification saying your 498 is approved, ready to go, and now you can go ahead and submit your bear form. So all of this information needs to be done in their system before it will even let you do a bear form and get your reimbursement. Now remember, this is only if you're doing paying bills in full, getting a reimbursement after the fact. If you're doing getting discounts on your bills from your service provider, none of this bear stuff applies to you. Starting this year, they changed how you access the bear form which is actually great. <laughs> um, it used to be in what they call their legacy system. This was the one form that you had to go somewhere different than the Epic system to submit a different website, but now they finally got it into, into Epic. Yay! Uh, however, to because not everybody does this, you do have to request access to it. It's not automatically available to everyone. Um, I've given you a link there at the bottom. There's also a link on our E-Rate website to that, where you go to request bear form access. Uh, what it is, is it's an Excel spreadsheet that you enter all your basic library information related to E-Rate. Um, you submit, fill all that in, save it, go into your Epic account, open up a customer service case, and you um, submit, upload this document to them, and then they will email you back when you have, your bare form access has been set up. I'm not sure how long it might take for that to come through. This is something new, um, but definitely, you know, same kind of thing. Do it ahead of time. Get your 498 done just whenever. Request your bear access as soon as you receive that 498 notification, and then you're good for any future needs um, of submitting bears. All of this is a one-time thing to get just set up in there, and then you're good for all future uh, funding years. Once you are set up for bear access, when you go to log in, Remember this screen from the way back in the beginning, we have our had our two choices. Now you'll have a third choice of the FCC form 472 bear that you can use just to do that form. So it's not exactly in the Epic system, but it's the same place you log in to get into Epic. Um, when you click on that, then it goes to uh, what you might recognize as the what the legacy system used to look like um, and all you have to enter here is your entity number that build entity number they no longer require a pin number to access the bear form this is also a great thing too uh, pin numbers if you remember this is from there's the previous incarnations of online access to doing e-rate and it was this convoluted numbers and letters and symbols and you always had to have that to log in every time it wasn't a password you created yourself it was issued by USAC and you couldn't change it. Um, and, you, and even though we had Epic since 2016, you still had to have that PIN number for this one form. Now you don't anymore. You just need to know your entry number. There. Once you submit your bear form, you will get a notification and your service, service provider will too, just letting them know that's been done. And then, no matter which way you're doing it, either discount on your bills or reimbursement, you'll start getting uh, quarterly reports showing you, telling you who USAC has sent money to. So take a look at these reports and compare them to, to your um, banking, your bank account or your bills to make sure you're getting the discounts. So, for example, it will list um, any if you decide to go to the bear, it'll say, "Hey, we sent this amount to this bank account." Check to make sure it's there, just to play it safe. It will also say um, your provider is doing a spy form and we've sent them this amount of money. Check your bills and make sure you're getting dis the discounts on your bills and you're getting the appropriate amount. Because um, this is telling you, this is the money USAC has sent out. And that is the end of the E-rate process with the invoicing. Ta-da! We did it all. <laughs> So I only have a couple more slides to sh um, just some basic info, uh, but I want to know if you have any other questions since we've gone through the whole process, um, all the E-rate forms. Um, do you have anything you wanted to know? Um, anything I didn't answer? Any questions you're wondering about as we went through this process? Anything you'd like me to explain in a little more detail um, about anything we've talked about today? Um, what's eligible? What you can get a discount on? How you submit a form? How anything works? Um, go ahead and type into the questions section and let me know um, if you have any questions before we wrap things up for today. I'll give you a couple of a minute or so here to do that.
No. All right, that's okay. If you don't have any questions right now, that's fine. Um, but you, you, you all know where to find me. You can ask me questions anytime you want to. So just to uh, wrap the last few things up here, uh, I have been mentioning that we do have an E-Rate website, um, a page on our Nebraska Library Commission website specifically for E-Rate. Um, that's the URL there, nlc.nebraska.gov slash E-Rate, or a link to a lot of different things that can help you out. I'll show you that in just a second here. Um, also, every fall, USAC does do applicant training. Um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, these were multiple workshops in person in various locations around the country. But for the last two years, they've done them online, of course. And they did these last month in November, and all the recordings of their sessions are now available on their website, too. So if you want to, you're welcome to go and watch any of their trainings. They did three days' worth of workshops online. Um, they also have some self-paced training modules and these great USEC videos, which are step-by-step -step of all the different forms. Um, showing everything that you'd need to do. Um, and they do have, for some of them, some PDF user guides if you prefer and do better with learning and following instructions that are on um, instruction guides like that. Um, I also mentioned the client, their customer service is called their Client Service Bureau. And this is their 800 number, 800-203-8100. Um, you can reach out to them with any questions you have too, if you want to. And um, there's a contact link in your Epic system to send the messages from there as well. And of course, as I said, my job here, you can contact me. Uh, there's my 800 number here at the Library Commission, my email address, call, email me. As I said, as your state E-Rate coordinator for public libraries, I am here to make sure you get these forms submitted and get your E-Rate funded. That is my main job, well, in this case. <laughs> now, I want to show you, and there we go, the E-Rate website that I've been talking about here. Yes, here's our web page on our Library Commission website where we have um, lots of different links here. I just wanna highlight a few things that we have. There is a timeline, a general timeline here, just so you can keep the track of generally at what time of year different forms should be submitted and what's coming up. These don't have specific dates for each year, uh, but just in general when you would be doing various things. Uh, once we do have a application filing window for the 471, I'll do one of these um, specific funding year deadlines uh, for the upcoming year. Some basic notifications here. Here's a link of telling about the recordings for USAC's training that they did. I will be there. Uh, today's is, uh, when this session is done, we will have a recording of my E-Rate workshop here that you are welcome to go back to and watch again if you want to. That will be linked here once we're done with these um, in live sessions. And the links to um, their training modules, and I want to show you these USAC videos that they have. These are um, there you go. Sp some specific for each form. Um, not too long. Some of them five minutes, ten minutes long. Um, some basics about the program. Um, a few of these do get a little longer on how to file a 470. Like um, they take a little more in depth there. But these are great videos. I highly recommend watching them. They all they're not too long. Um, and they are updated each year for any changes to the forms or any changes to the rules. So definitely use these if you want to as more um, help. Also, I want to point out here where I have a link to that Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit to help you figure out what you have in your library. Uh, the Reduced Lunch Counts from the Nebraska Department of Education, I have a link right there to that. Looking up your FCC registration number is here, different tutorials. Um, the bare form access, the new bare form access, information about that and where that spreadsheet is, I've got a link right to there. Um, USAC website, it's not always as easy to find some things, so I've tried to pull out things that you more come, most often would go to here. Um, my basic information about SIPA, uh, about it, what you know, information from the FCC and ALA, and some resources for looking up different options for filtering. 
Uh, and then if you're interested, um, all this E-rate information is public out there for anyone to, to see. It's, it's, a, it's a public program. Um, and I, we have here, going back to 1998, um, if you want to know who in Nebraska has received E-rate funding each year and how much, you can see what has been um, received. All right, so that is our E-rate workshop for today. Um, any last minute questions or comments or anything you want to ask of me while you have me here, uh, type in the question section. Uh, if you go to webinar interface, I can uh, explain anything more in detail, answer anything you're confused about, elaborate on anything. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, and thank you for coming in. Um, otherwise, definitely reach out to me as you're doing your E-rate. Um, call me, email me, mail me if you have any questions or issues or confusions. That's what I'm here for. I want to make sure you get your piece of the E-rate pie. All right. Thank you very much for being joining me today. And good luck with your E-rate application. Bye.